Do you found the skeleton? How would you tell them that was You first, first, first. How would you tell them Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Today I'm going to take a look at a lecture given back in 2019 by Dr. John Sanford who taught biology at the university level for some 18 years. Which means if he gets biology wrong, he doesn't have much of an excuse. Now John Sanford is the guy who came up with the idea that resurrecting the long debunked idea of error catastrophe and rebranding it as genetic entropy would somehow be a problem for science. I'm not going to get too far into that now as he'll get into it later, but it should be noted that he's also Sal Cordova's boss, or partner, it's unclear to me. So Sal, when you watch this, sorry about being mean to Sanford, but he's going to say some very silly things. The title of this talk is What Darwin Got Wrong, and here's the thing about that. It's being used as a way to try to persuade his audience that science is wrong about biology. But here's the problem with that. It makes no more sense than it would to say that because Newton spent a bunch of time trying to transmute lead into gold, Therefore, modern physics is nonsense. See, the problem is no one cares what Newton said on the grounds that he's the one who said it. We only care in science to the extent that his statements conform to the evidence. And it's the same with Darwin. No one cares about what Darwin got wrong. We only care about what he got right because it conforms to reality. And if he had never said it, then we wouldn't care. So what I'm going to do is simply pretend that when Sanford complains about what Darwin said, that he's complaining about modern science, since that's what matters. And I will use modern science up until around the point of 2018, the year before this talk, to back up my corrections of Sanford. I'm only going up to 2018, since going much past that wouldn't be fair, as even if Dr. Sanford were careful to keep up with the literature, there'd be a fair chance that anything relevant that was that recent he might have missed simply by chance. Well, now that we have that long preamble out of the way, here we go. Time to hear from Sanford himself. All right. Well, I'm, uh, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to share with you tonight. You know what? Me too. And it's a privilege for me to come alongside the people at Creation Ministries International. Dr. Sanford is at this CMI event, but he doesn't actually work for them. He's mostly retired, and as far as I know, he was never actually employed by a creationist organization. Um, and this is an awesome ministry that they have, and I'm just glad to offer my small part. Uh, today, I've been asked to talk about the subject of Darwin was wrong, and that is a big subject. Uh, so, um, in addition to being now a semi-retired professor at Cornell University, where I hold a courtesy position, um, I'm also president of Logos Research Associates, which is a group of scientists um, who are showing that good science affirms scripture. Well, yeah, as a rule, anyone who died 137 years before you talk about them was wrong about a fair bit of stuff. See, that's something I don't really have a problem with, as long as you're not starting with the conclusion. As I've said before, if you just happen to find that science confirms your reading of a sacred text, then that's cool. But if you start out with the conclusion that it does, and then you cram science into that ill-fitting box you've constructed for it, then you're not doing science. Anyone want to take bets as to which one the people at Logos Research Associates are doing? And back in 2009, the year of Darwin, the year of the 150th celebration of his book, Origin of Species, uh, Logos sponsored a Darwin Was Wrong conference at a mega church in California. Yeah, that fact alone indicates to me that they're probably not doing science. If they were, they'd have a conference on, you know, science, not a historical figure from 150 years ago, who obviously isn't really publishing in the field. We all know Darwin got many things wrong. It doesn't matter. In fact, I find it hard to see why you talk about it at a science conference dedicated to overthrowing the modern consensus, unless you had ulterior motives. At a history conference, that would make sense, although talking about what he got wrong would be an odd thing to focus on even there. But at least Darwin, per se, would make sense as a topic. Uh, in, through Calvary Chapel. And that uh, involved 10 speakers who talked about their 10 different ways that Darwin was wrong, and it took, you know, like 10 hours. And um, so today I'm going to give you a slightly shorter version of that. And um, I'd just uh, like to ask you, why would it matter if Darwin was wrong? Yeah, that is a great question. I mean, everybody's wrong sometime. I mean, if you look at any historical figure, you're going to find, you can find fault with things or things they didn't know. That's true. It's kind of why we don't worship Darwin or venerate him as a saint. But of course, the reason it's important is because 
this seemingly ordinary man. He's the only one, I believe, in human history who simultaneously impacted so powerfully both scientifically and spiritually the world. He changed the world in a profound way. Yeah, kind of. The thing is, his ideas did, but those ideas don't depend on him. In fact, he wasn't the only one around at the time who had the same basic idea of variation in natural selection and later sexual selection. It's kind of like Newton and calculus. Calculus was also being worked out by others, and if Newton had keeled over dead of drinking mercury before he got Principia Mathematica finished, then at worst, calculus would have been delayed a few years. The same is the case with Darwin and the theory of evolution. If he had never written Origin of Species and his later works, then we might be a few decades behind on evolutionary biology, but that's it. And that's because Darwin isn't the prophet of science. No one is bowing down towards the Galapagos and saying there is no science but evolution and Darwin is its prophet. Modern papers don't normally reference Darwin unless they're mentioning a species he described and then really only to credit him with the description. And he profoundly, the consequences of his ideas uh, have had profound social and moral consequences. Did you know that bad consequences don't make a proposition false? That the consequences of your house being on fire are bad doesn't mean your house isn't on fire. So really, the world we live in today has been shaped by this, these concepts that he, uh, are, are attributed to him. Right, in the same way that the world has been shaped by the concepts attributed to Pythagoras. Pythagoras was right about a bunch of things, but he also thought irrational numbers didn't exist to the point of maybe murdering someone for proving that they did, and he thought beans were evil. Yet, I don't see creation as saying that because Pythagoras got things wrong that we should toss out trigonometry. Well, except maybe for some flat earthers. Then again, the only difference between believing in a flat earth and a young earth is how long we've known you're wrong. And so, you see, if Darwin was wrong, it's a really, really big deal. It's an earth-changing deal. No, it's really not. It's as big a deal as that Pythagoras was wrong. No one does trigonometry the way it's done now because of Pythagoras. They do it because there are mathematical proofs and it works in the real world. Similarly, no one believes in evolution because Darwin said it as if he's a prophet. People accept evolutionary theory because it fits the evidence and makes predictions, which can be and are confirmed, and just as importantly, can be and are not falsified. And I believe he was wrong. I believe we can show that Darwin was profoundly wrong about all the key issues. Well, let's keep in mind that since it doesn't matter, I'm going to be judging this on the basis of actual contemporary science, not science from more than a century and a half ago. And that includes both the scientific issues and the spiritual issues. Why? Who the heck is getting spiritual guidance from Darwin? So let's go on and look at the different ways that Darwin was wrong. So Darwin was wrong about many things. I'm only going to cover what I consider the seven most important mistakes that Darwin made. Darwin was obviously wrong about God. Don't care. Darwin was wrong about science in a fundamental way. Darwin was wrong about geology. Darwin was wrong about the fossil record. Darwin was wrong about the tree of life. Darwin was wrong about the nature of life. And Darwin was wrong about the thing that he's best known for, which is natural selection. The thing he's best known for and was most right about. I look forward to Sanford's explanation of how it can be that an easily observed phenomenon just doesn't occur. Now, most people in the university environment believe he was right on all seven points. I would be very curious to see a survey of modern scientists on whether they agree with Darwin on agnosticism and whatever the heck the nature of life is. I bet it's not going to be even close to universal assent like Sanford claims. But I'm going to show you that he wasn't. So the first one is Darwin was wrong about God. Well, I don't care about that, so unless some scientific claims are made about the natural world, I will skip. So, icon number two, Darwin was wrong about science. So here we have the thinker with Darwin's face showing. And so the question was, is this, is, was Darwin primarily a scientist or a philosopher? In case you're wondering, I saved you from like five full minutes of whining about how skepticism was valued in the 19th century and how even Christians knew that the Earth was old. He's usually billed as one of the greatest scientists who ever lived. But if you read his work and the commentaries on his life, you will realize that he was, in fact, primarily a philosopher. People can be more than one thing at a time. So he was primarily a philosopher, as can be seen by the fact that he was utterly committed to philosophical naturalism. But he wasn't. He was a believer until the death of one of his young children. 
He was committed to methodological naturalism in science, as all good scientists are. Methodological naturalism is the idea that science is the study of how the natural world operates, whether or not supernatural entities are real, nor are they to be used as explanatory mechanisms. And this is how science must proceed, because science is fundamentally about things that happen reliably. God, should he exist, by most accounts, is not so reliable that you could experiment on him. Further, if a miracle occurred, all science could do would be to fail to explain such an occurrence. It couldn't declare it a miracle, but similarly, it couldn't say it wasn't. The other option is to allow an untestable divine foot in the door, and that simply leads to stagnation. Why investigate storms when we all know it's just Thor fighting the Jotun? Why bother to figure out why volcanoes erupt when all we really need to do is toss enough fine liquor into them to propitiate Pele? Why investigate how biodiversity is generated or how organisms are related by descent when Jesus just made them more or less the way they are now? Methodological naturalism isn't philosophical naturalism, and scientists aren't required to be philosophical naturalists. Many scientists are explicit supernaturalists in their philosophy, but they also know why supernatural causation has no place in science, even if it's real. That is, he started, his work started and ended on the, on the premise that he must build on the Enlightenment philosophy of naturalism or materialism. In science, and he's right about that. Furthermore, his only degree was in theology, and he didn't study theology because he was interested in God. In fact, being a man who'd grown up Unitarian but was attending an Anglican seminary, he didn't study theology all that much at all. He was much more interested in horse riding, hunting, and taxidermy. The only reason he was there was that his father was upset that he'd abandoned his medical training, and there weren't many acceptable occupations for a wealthy Englishman. And medical doctor and clergyman were two of them. But because it would, might put him in the right places at the right time for his career advancement. Or so thought his father. Turns out, it really didn't, and Darwin got on in naturalist circles on the basis of his careful observation, specimen collection and preparation, and his keen theoretical mind. I'm not aware of any naturalists, which is what scientists were called at the time, asking for his opinion on the Trinity, the Incarnation, the Virgin Birth, or Soteriology. He was not an experimentalist. Not all science takes place in a lab where experiments are done on the objects of study. Does Dr. Sanford have a view of science equivalent to that of a fourth grader? Let's go away from biology and look into other sciences in which experimentation is difficult or impossible. Chief among these is astronomy. You can't put stellar objects in a test tube and manipulate them. You have to just look into the sky and see what you see. You can take stellar spectra and break them down with laboratory equipment. You can make predictions about the orbits of stars, the formation of galaxies, the distribution of interstellar matter, etc. But you can't grab a galaxy and stir it about to see what happens. At best, you can simulate it, but that's hypothesis building, not really an experiment on the subject of study itself. Similarly, field biology, which is most of Darwin's primary research, is done by observing, collecting, and cataloging wildlife. Darwin didn't need to bring back a boat full of aviaries with live birds in order to do science both on his voyage and afterward. And also, he didn't need to be constantly gathering more specimens in order to hypothesize about the data he had already collected. It is unusual the degree to which his scientific career is split into a distinct and prolific data gathering phase, followed by a phase of intense theoretical work with little further data gathering. But that doesn't invalidate it. And even if it did, guess what? Modern science doesn't give two shits about what Darwin said or that he said it. Really, I'm just pointing out that Sanford has what could charitably be termed a childlike and naive understanding of the basics of what science is, how it functions, and why it is the way that it is. Now, he had an awesome adventure on the Beagle for seven years. And, that, and he had some wonderful observations and experiences during that time in his life. And he did a lot of science while he was doing it. But from that time until he was an old man, he really didn't do any experimental science. Not personally, but again, experiment isn't a necessary condition for science to be done. And further, he consulted with those who were conducting experiments in artificial selection. And I'll point out that artificial selection isn't exactly non-natural, since it's done by humans, not as far as we can tell, by ghosts or gods or angels. He, um, as an old man, he, liked, he loved to do experiments with worms and ants. Why do you suppose he wanted to do that? Because he wanted to argue that human behavior can be traced back to just natural selection. You mean as a young man, before he'd come up with the idea of natural selection, he was doing the experiments we were told he didn't do in order to demonstrate the idea that he hadn't? Sal, so if you're watching this, what's up with your boy John here? Am I really supposed to take this man seriously? As, and, and he assumed that worms and ants have no moral uh, guidance. Given that they barely have brains, that's not such an unusual conclusion to reach. So, mostly he was an amateur scientist. He was pretty much sequestered in his living room all his life. He never had to work, work for, earn a living. And so he just spent his whole life developing his evolutionary theory. He was truly a man p possessed with that fixation. 
More or less, yes. But here's where I have to break in to remind everyone that the point of this talk is not really to say how much Darwin sucked, because properly understood, whether he did or not doesn't matter. So are there modern experiments in evolution? Well, of course. Experiments are routinely done in organisms with short generation spans, since that's where evolution is easiest to observe. There are famous experiments, like the Luria Delbruck experiment, that demonstrated not just natural selection, but that mutations, still not really understood at the time, were spontaneous and not in response to specific stimuli. There's a Lensky long-term E. coli experiment that has not only demonstrated natural selection, but also shown why basically every creationist objection to it fails. It has shown that irreducible complexity isn't a barrier to evolution, shown that the waiting time problem isn't a problem, and demonstrated that genetic entropy simply isn't a thing that can be found in the real world outside of creationist computer programs specifically designed to find it. But there are other experiments that are less famous but still provide confirmation of evolutionary theory all the time. Biology students the world over raise fruit flies for experiments in genetics and natural selection in some cases even managing to cause speciation events in captive populations. There are experiments on bacteria on large prepared surfaces being forced to adapt to ever-increasing amounts of toxins, where in the experiment itself you can trace the branching paths of bacterial evolution. There are fossil digs whose location is based on evolutionary biology to find predicted fossil organisms, making just the dig itself an experiment. No matter how much or how little experimentation Darwin did, lack of experimentation in evolutionary biology is not a thing. And he, his, what he did for, as his line of argumentation was he relied heavily on extrapolation. Well, let's see, if we see a little selection going on in nature, then if we have enough time, eventually, who knows what it could accomplish. And uh, in addition, he relied heavily on just so stories. Does that sound like modern Darwinists today? I don't know anyone today who describe themselves as a Darwinist, so I don't know. And no, this isn't just nitpicking. Call people what they call themselves, where at all possible. No one is a Darwinist because no one is a follower of Darwin per se. Would young earth creationists like it if I just called them baby earth lunatics? Probably not, and I don't do it, because it's needlessly unhelpful. It's not how they identify, and it implies things about them that they would reject. Similarly, no one that I know of self-identifies as a Darwinist, and it implies a devotion to the ideas of Darwin that I have never known to exist anywhere. It's really, nothing's changed. So, in science, a credible story is, is not a proof. Well, you have an answer to, could this thing happen? If you want to know, how did this thing happen? Then you've got a lot more to do. But the thing is, what creationists like to do is pretend that the basic and readily observable phenomena in evolution are simply impossible. And all this needed to show that something isn't impossible is one possible way for it to occur. For example, if you tell me it's impossible to drive from Fairbanks, Alaska to Tampa, Florida, in response to someone claiming such a drive has happened, or is at least possible, then all I need to do is to show that there are in fact roads between those locations and show that at least one possible route exists. Now that doesn't mean that Joe over here who claims to have driven between the two had to take the route that I describe. Maybe he took one of the myriad other possible routes. But because at least one exists, the impossibility argument is defeated. Similarly, if a creationist says that an irreducibly complex structure can't evolve, all that needs to be done is to show that a single plausible pathway for any irreducibly complex structure to evolve exists, and that argument is finished. But in evolutionary science, if you can tell a story and it sounds feasible, there you got an answer, because there's no way to test it. Of course there are. That's just a lie. And yes, I'm calling Dr. John Sanford a liar, because he worked for nearly two decades as a professor of biology. I'll give an example. Some rodents and all monkeys have a broken gene that in other animals allows them to synthesize a vitamin C. As a result, animals like guinea pigs, humans, and spider monkeys are all susceptible to scurvy. Also, there are a few possibilities. Maybe since rodents and primates are fairly closely related among the mammal orders, this is a shared trait, and some rodents simply re-evolved vitamin C synthesis. Alternatively, perhaps each species had an independent loss of vitamin C synthetic capacity. Last, perhaps the ancestor of monkeys lost this ability, and so did the ancestor of, say, caviomorphs, independently. Well, how could we test this? By looking at the genes for making vitamin C. If this ability was lost in a common ancestor of primates and rodents, then we should expect a particular mutation or set of mutations to the vitamin C gene shared across all those organisms, with varying repair mechanisms among animals like beavers, colugos, and lemurs, such that each rodent, scandentian, or primate with a functioning vitamin C gene should have significantly different ones, since they were independently derived and then presumably through different mutations repaired that function. If, on the other hand, this is broken independently in many lineages, then we should expect different causes for the gene's non-function in different lineages, so humans, capybaras, and baboons should all have different causes for the non-functionality of this gene. If instead this breakage happened only twice, in a rodent, 
and then in an ancestral monkey, then we should expect that all monkey pseudogenes to make vitamin C should be broken in the same way, but that it should be a different way to the way that it is broken in rodents. Now, before we even go check, we can tell that the two breakages model is the most parsimonious, so it's probably the one we put our money on. As it turns out, this experiment was done, and the two breakages model was supported and the others disconfirmed. Right there is an observation that some gliers cannot produce vitamin C, a hypothesis that there are two separate events causing the gulo gene to break and no longer function, and an experimental test that is sequencing the genomes of rodents and monkeys. Finally, we have a discarded alternate hypothesis, not just on the grounds that they seem more complex, but on the basis of actual evidence, some of which is experimental. That's exactly what Dr. Sanford pretends can't be done. And so lastly, uh, he, his theories lacked scientific rigor. He, he made arguments and defenses for his ideas, but they didn't follow scientific procedures. There was not, there's not a single equation in his book. There's no mathematics in his book, no numbers. Boy, was I wrong. No numbers, huh? Well, that's weird because while I'll ignore dates and page numbers, there's an estimate that a monarch in India kept 20,000 pigeons. In the section of geometrical ratio and increase in population size, there's a discussion of elephant population growth over time that uses math. In the section complex relation of all animals and plants to each other in the struggle for existence, there's a discussion using math of the various reproductive capacities of Trifolium repens, the Dutch clover, and T. pratens, the red clover. In the section specific characters more variable than generic characters, we have a discussion of ratios of individuals in previous generations that count as ancestors. That requires math. In the section on the lapse of time, as inferred by the rate of deposition and the extent of denudation, Darwin uses a whole mess of math to come up with the estimated minima for the duration of deposition of various rock formations. So I have to wonder, why is Sanford saying that Darwin doesn't do any math in Origin of Species? It's demonstrably not true, and all you have to do is go find the online edition from Gutenberg.org and use Control F to search the document, then type literally any numeral. I used zero. So has Sanford not read the book, or even bothered to check his claims by the easiest imaginable option which would give good results? Does he just not care whether the things he says are true? Is he lying? I doubt I'll hear from Sanford himself. But hey, if Sal Cordova is watching, I encourage him to pass this question along to Dr. Sanford, because I would really like an explanation for Sanford just spouting obvious falsehoods about a book that I'll remind people is irrelevant to actual modern science. And um, there's no logical proofs or formal logic in his, he just argues his point like a philosopher would. Weird, because formal logic is actually the domain of philosophy and is far less important in science because science is empirical and interestingly, empiricism is more or less impossible to arrive at as reliable by formal logic. This is because consistent past experiences do not logically entail that future experiences will be the same. If every time you've ever seen a swan, it was white, it doesn't demonstrate that the next time you see a swan, it will be white. And for some people who saw the first black swan, that was dramatically demonstrated. So we shouldn't expect formal proofs in science. That's not what science does. It's what philosophy and mathematics do. I find it deeply ironic that Dr. Sanford is complaining that Darwin wasn't scientific enough and was too philosophical because he did science and not philosophy. You know who is scientific enough though? My subscribers. So why not go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already done so? It's free and you can undo it if you regret it. Also, remember to use the bell icon to turn on all notifications. So let's just look a little more carefully at what the scientific process is. Oh goody. Scientific process begins with conception, which involves brainstorming and free speculation. And here I thought it started with observation. I guess we don't need that. Yes, scientists are allowed to speculate and have fun at it, but that's, if, they can't, if they stop there, it's not science. Kind of like all the solutions for the heat problem of the flood, all just speculation. For those of you who don't know, the heat problem is the problem that all models for how Noah's flood occurred produce enough heat to at minimum boil Earth's oceans away several times over. There are no plausible solutions to this so far put forward, and most young Earth creationists have simply concluded that it was a miracle, immediately removing the whole idea of their flood model from the realm of science. So after conception, scientists need to discipline their ideas and form hypotheses that are testable which means that they don't get to have an omnipotent entity as part of them, since by definition an omnipotent entity can do anything, meaning there's no way to test it, since all possible results are compatible with such an entity. No, that doesn't mean there is no such entity, simply that science can't say anything about it if it exists. That's essential to good science, and then the scientist has to do experiments to test the hypotheses and see if they're correct or false. Not really, at least not in the way that most people think of experiments, where you have a test and a control and a variable that you can freely manipulate. That's awesome when you can do it, and you can in much of evolutionary biology, but like I mentioned, with astronomy, some science doesn't really offer the possibility of a direct experiment. 
This is also true with most of meteorology, climatology, and much of biology. Hypothesis testing in these cases is done by predicting not the outcomes of laboratory experiments, but of subsequent observations. For example, special relativity was first tested not in a laboratory, but by measuring apparent star positions during a solar eclipse to see if they would shift as a result of gravitational lensing as predicted by Einstein. This isn't an experiment in a lab, but still, Einstein made a prediction that was testable by observation, and it was tested and confirmed. Different scientific endeavors require different methodologies. And they must, those experiments must be reproducible by other scientists. Or the observations must be themselves available to other scientists, or sufficiently similar subsequent observations must be. And lastly, they get to then defend their thesis. Now, Darwin was awesome at number one and number four. Well, his ideas are falsifiable. Indeed, many of them, like blended inheritance, have been falsified. So he was good at number two. And as I said, when you realize that three includes the option of subsequent observations rather than laboratory work, and that while Darwin himself didn't spend much time after his voyage on the Beagle on such observations, others did. And he was well aware of their observations and the fact that they generally lined up with his ideas of common ancestry and natural selection. Darwin's scientific process uh, it began with some really creative brainstorming and, and speculation, but instead of hypothesis formation, he had very few testable hypotheses. The three main hypotheses of his that are relevant today are natural selection, sexual selection, and common ancestry. But even many of his other hypotheses, such as gemules being the cause of inheritance, were testable and have been falsified, which is why no one talks about them. Because remember, Darwin doesn't matter to science, only to history. We're going to talk about one. But uh, generally, he used creative storytelling as his, uh, to, to build up, to, to formulate his ideas. And then instead of experimental research, he usually used examples from nature and then lots of, as I said, extrapolation. Oh, so instead of experiment, he used observation, the thing that's perfectly fine in science. Got it. So he was not form following the formal scientific process. Well, I disagree, but so what? Even if he wasn't, that doesn't mean scientists aren't now, and that's what's important. As I've already gone over, there are countless experiments in evolutionary biology. So here's the icon number three. Darwin was wrong about geology. And we have two books here, or in this one case, a book and a, a, a trilogy. And it's really interesting to know that Darwin only took two books with him on the voyage of the Beagle. He took with him the Bible, and the book by Charles Lyell, which was newly published, called The Principles of Geology. Which is one of the first books to push for the still current idea that most sedimentary rocks formed in the past the same way the same kind of rocks form today in depositional environments, and which was written by a lifelong and devout Christian. And these two books are very diametrically opposed, as we'll see. Lyell will be quite surprised to hear that as a Christian. See, this is one of the things, as I often say, that annoys me about young earth creationists. They presume that people who honestly don't interpret the Bible the way they do just don't care about the Bible. This isn't true. Christians who are theistic evolutionists don't think the Bible is just useless or something. They also try to take it seriously. This isn't a fight between the good Bible-believing, God-fearing Christians and the godless heathen atheist evolutionists. This is a fight between a small minority of extremists within Christianity and basically everyone who actually cares about science and the truth. And so he had to choose. And what we know is that within months of leaving port in England, he had rejected the Bible. If the choice between Lyell and the Bible is so stark and binary, then why didn't even Lyell make it? Further, Sanford is just wrong about Darwin leaving his faith on the Beagle. He had always had doubts, but he didn't finally abandon his faith until the death of his daughter in 1851, whereas the seven-year voyage of the Beagle started in 1831. Weird how it took 13 years or so from the time he completely abandoned the Bible until he actually, you know, abandoned the Bible. Although he certainly wasn't what Sanford would consider an orthodox Christian before that. But again, Sanford isn't the judge of Christianity, which is, like all religions, internally diverse in beliefs, fervor, piety, and practice. I should also point out that despite, you know, Lyle being the guy who wrote Principles of Geology, he was a lifelong Christian, and while he helped Darwin publish about natural selection, he himself never much liked it. Freed from the constraints of Victorian society, he had decided the Bible was just a lot of myths from, created by ignorant people. I mean, it literally is mostly myths written by ignorant people. Myths are foundational stories, usually involving a god or gods that explain the origin of things, like a particular people group, the world as a whole, various parts of the world, and how all those things are to interact with each other and to the divine. That's a lot of what the Bible is, and it was written by ignorant people because we know for a fact the people of the Iron Age, which is when the majority of the Bible was written, were ignorant of much of what we know. That's not an insult to them, it's just a fact. To pretend the Bible isn't in large part myths is to not understand what myth is as a genre. To say that it was not written by ignorant people is to simply ignore all history. And uh, 
but he absorbed Charles Lyell's book on uniformity, uniformitarian geology as the gospel, and we're going to see that that was his foundation. Slow and gradual geology was the basis for his theorizing about slow and gradual biological change. Yeah, there are certainly some thematic similarities there. That's fair. So I'd just like to recount to you one, one episode in his life as he was traveling uh, through the world on the Beagle, and that was an expedition that he and the crew members took up the Santa Cruz River Valley. So this is the Santa Cruz River in Argentina, not the one in Arizona. But Sanford takes an extremely long time to say that Darwin attributed the valley to the direct action of the Santa Cruz River when in fact it was formed by a glacier. I'm skipping that because it made me fall asleep standing and I don't want to subject my audience to it. If we now turn 180 degrees to look back down from the lake, turn 180 degrees so we can look back down the valley, what we see is uh, this picture, again from Google Earth. And what we see is that in the foreground there are landforms which are giant sand dunes that reflect a, a massive flood of water. This is just like the Missoula flood. Yes, this is indeed much like the Missoula floods that caused the scablands in Washington state in the USA. And yes, Darwin was quite wrong about how exactly the valley formed, which is kind of why no one really cares what Darwin said in terms of our current understanding of science. It's another example of, as been repeatedly demonstrated in different parts of the world, where during, after the end of the Ice Age, glacial lakes drained catastrophically, creating major valleys. So it's really, there's Steve Austin and other geologists have... Ah uh, yes, Steve Austin, the guy who tried to discredit radiometric dating by sending samples he knew couldn't be tested by the lab he was sending them to, then crowed triumphantly because they couldn't give him a reliable date, with one possible exception. That exception, even in his own work, showed xenocrysts, which is why he got back a valid date on that one sample. And of course, when all this was pointed out to him, his response amounted to Nuh uh, I'm right, you're wrong, ha <laughs> ha. Citing Stephen Austin about geology is worthless. He's an academic fraud and he knows it. Have shown that these, these uh, evidences of a massive flood, including uh, uh, whole sandbars made of boulders, uh, is the full length of the river. And it's clear this river was carved catastrophically uh, with the breaching of an of a ice dam uh, at the end of the Ice Age. So. So I neither know nor care what Darwin thought about local catastrophism. Today, geologists, that is real geologists, not intentional frauds like Steve Austin, Taz Walker, and Andrew Snelling, know that some things like massive ice dam breaches, volcanoes, tsunamis, and volcanoes can rapidly deposit or erode sediment. This is taken into account and those rocks that show evidence of such events are accepted as such. Geology is well past strict uniformitarianism and a rejection of any catastrophic events as the cause of modern rocks. Uh, it's really ironic that this valley that he considered the his inspiration for slow and gradual. I thought his inspiration was Charles Lyell. Darwin wasn't a geologist, and Lyell was. That's why, throughout his life, Darwin relied on Lyell for things like geology. Although Darwin did make estimates for deposition times, he still did so on the basis of the work of Lyell and other geologists, not on his own theoretical work in geology, which, as far as I can tell, he did none of in the first place. Should it be at all surprising that a man who was more interested in animals than in rocks failed to notice that he was in a moraine come flood valley? And further, who cares? Modern geology isn't still debating about the Santa Cruz River Valley. And his foundation, his conceptual foundation for evolution, slow and gradual, actually was formed catastrophically by a flood. I'm sorry, is the argument that if Darwin had been right about this one valley, he would never have thought the Earth was of great age, and so he would never have come up with gradualistic evolution by natural selection, and so we would never have known about it, and so modern science would just be sticking with, I don't know, guess it was magic when it comes to the origin of biodiversity? That can't be the argument, right? That is the dumbest thing I've heard said by someone besides like Matt Powell, Matt Nylor, or Kent Hovind, or maybe a flurf. Although really this argument is giving Flat Earth Roscoe's idea that the moon is made of glass dug from the Grand Canyon by giants a run for its money. Maybe that's not what Sanford is trying to say. I sure hope not. So that's really interesting and it, it, it really is ironic that it shows that uh, his foundation, which was the uniformitarian geology. Which, as has already been admitted by Sanford, was not derived from his personal observations and theorizing, but on the work of Charles Lyell. Is uh, invalid. Okay, so because Darwin was wrong about the formation of a valley, the Earth is young and evolution is nonsense. That's the only way I can interpret this. And quite frankly, I don't think that Sanford could possibly have survived almost two decades as a science professor while having ideas that brain dead. I'm connected to Sanford by like two steps, and I would really prefer not to have the conclusion that he's just a liar. 
but it's becoming increasingly hard for me to come to any other conclusions. If you think you have a version of this argument that at least qualifies as an actual coherent thought, please put it in the comments, because maybe I'm just a cynical jerk who can't be charitable enough to young earth creationists anymore. So uniformitarian geology in the last several decades, geologists have shown over and over and over again that there are massive evidences of catastrophism in the geological record. Yes, but not of a single aqueous catastrophe, which is what young earth creationism needs. When you have evidence of earthquakes and volcanoes and floods interspersed with low energy deposition, subaerial rocks and evaporites, all of which cannot be deposited during a global flood, it means that you absolutely do not have evidence of a global catastrophe, but rather many local ones. And the best creationists have managed is to just lie about rocks, doing things like knowingly sending rocks to be dated in labs that can't do what is requested like Steve Austin did, or just lying about cross bending angles and where in the geological record fossils come from, like Andrew Snelling. And so Lyell's thesis that there's never any gradual, any catastrophism is dead, Lyell is discredited, and his uh, principles of geology are of only uh, interest in, as a historical relic. Yeah, like the origin of species. That's why no one teaching a modern evolutionary biology or geology course would assign either origin of species or principles of geology as the textbook. To the surprise of no one, except those who expect all knowledge to be handed down from on high unchangingly, science has managed to move on in the last dozen and more decades. Which is why if you want to talk about how you're going to overturn either modern evolutionary biology or modern geology, you really can't start by going to Lyell or Darwin. No one will care. You need to look at actual current literature and tackle that. It's the same thing as flat earthers complaining about the historical uncertainties of Aristosthenes and his experiment in which he calculated the circumference of the earth. Who cares if Aristosthenes even existed? It doesn't matter. No one is using his well experiment today as their way of measuring the planet. And creationists, if you're insulted when I keep comparing you to flat earthers, then stop acting like them. So uniformitarian geology is dead, his foundation is dead, but guess what? The word of God remains alive. So he clearly chose the wrong book. What does that even mean? That the Bible has been open to revision based on new evidence, but no one has revised it? Obviously not, because the Bible is a collection of texts. Ancient texts are what they are, no matter if they're right or wrong, or what new evidence comes to light with the sole exception of new manuscripts of the text itself. If I could prove with mathematical certainty that every interpretation of the Bible was nonsense and that literally everything in it were completely false, that wouldn't mean that the Bible would be updated. Science, on the other hand, isn't a collection of texts, it's a technique, as we've already heard rather poorly explained. Geology isn't Charles Lyell's principles of geology. Geology is the study of rocks that make up the earth, how they formed and how they got to be where they are today. Evolutionary biology isn't the origin of species. It's the study of how organisms have changed in the past and are changing now. But there are parts of both books that have survived the test of time and scientific rigor, like the great age of the earth and natural selection. Pointing out that old science books aren't much used today and that people still believe in the Bible, which hasn't much changed, doesn't mean anything for science. Okay, the next set topic I'd like to speak about is uh, that Darwin was wrong about the fossils. And Darwin, um, so I chose as an icon for that topic, the coelacanth. Of course, because we can't go more than a day without some creationist sticking his foot so far in his mouth he chokes on it while talking about the coelacanth. Let's get it over with. And uh, you may know that the coelacanth is a famous uh, uh, fossil that is known for is the fact that it's been around for, it was within the geological column supposedly for several hundred million years. The coelacanth is a fossil that's in the geologic column for several hundred million years. Yikes. So taken at face value, that means that a single fish was found spanning basically all of the Mesozoic. And we named that single individual colossal fish the coelacanth. So since that's almost incomprehensibly dumb, and even if I'm being more charitable than I have any need to be, poorly communicated. Let's talk about what the coelacanth is. Coelacanths are now represented by a single deep sea genus, Latimeria, but during the Mesozoic also existed in a variety of shallow marine and freshwater forms, all of which are distinct enough from modern Latimeria to warrant different generic designations. Among Sarcopterygians, that is the lobe fin fish and tetrapods, coelacanths are more closely related to tetrapods than some, being crossopterygian, meaning that their paired fins are similar to tetrapod limbs in some way, but they're farther than others. They're farther from tetrapods than lungfish are, which together make up Ripidistia, with the lungfish in Dipnomorpha and the tetrapods in Tetrapodomorpha, with non-tetrapod forms like Pandrichthys. Their fossil record has never included deep sea examples, for the simple reason that deep sea fossils are hard to come by at all, and so our fossil record for such environments is extremely sparse. But their shallow water fossil record stretches to the end of the Cretaceous, 
when, like many things, living near the surface, they went extinct. Turns out that living at the bottom of the ocean leaves you pretty well safe from an asteroid impact on the other side of the planet. And so despite not having a presence in the fossil-bearing strata of the Cenozoic, one genus of coelacanth survived. But then mysteriously disappeared uh, about 65 million years ago, according to the interpretation of the fossil record. It's not that mysterious. A giant space rock slammed into the planet. And uh, furthermore, this fish was, has very large fins and... Uh, not really. The distinctiveness of the fins of the lobe-finned fish is in their internal anatomy of the fins, not their size. That's why they're called lobe-finned and not big-finned. The interesting thing about them is the complex internal structure of bones and muscle. And so it was believed to be a transitional form. These large fins, it was thought to be living in shallow water. We know for a fact that many coelacanths lived in coastal waters, but far from being a great transition to tetrapods, Coelacanths are among the most basally branching lobe finned fish, and so members of this clade can only really resemble the most basal forms from which tetrapods would later diverge. But even then, they are also derived, which obscures some of these clues about the primitive skeleton and musculature common to lobe finned fish, yourself included. And that it would crawl, kind of creep along the bottom with its fins, and eventually might creep up on land and become the transitional form to uh, amphibians. Wrong. Coelacanths are quite unsuited to terrestrial locomotion, and there is no idea that they were ancestral to tetrapods. There are many much closer organisms that in fact do show transitional forms. These are animals like Eusthenopteron, Pendrichthes, Elginerpeton, Acanthostega, Ichthyostega, Crassigerinus, and Loxoma. I'll note that all of these form a wonderful transitional lineage from fully aquatic fish like Eusthenopteron all the way to the earliest tetrapods, and all without ever mentioning a coelacanth since they're not on the line to tetrapods. So uh, the interesting thing about this fish is that we now know that the coelacanth is still alive today. And it's been found to be uh, alive today. It's an example of a living fossil. It didn't go extinct 65 million years ago. Since it didn't go extinct, the 65 million years becomes highly questionable, doesn't it? Since it doesn't mark something that didn't happen. What is he talking about? The coelacanth isn't a single species. It's a whole order. It's like saying, Gee, all the rodents went extinct, except for this one genus of mouse. I guess nothing happened. That's so beyond reasonable, I am forced to conclude that Sanford is just lying to his audience. Every single genus but one of the entire order went extinct with all the non-avian dinosaurs, most of the crocodilians, all the sauropterygians, every pterosaur, most sea turtles, all the mosasaurs, etc. The fact that something survived is not at all something that brings into question whether anything at all even happened. The only thing special about coelacanths, compared to the other groups that survived, like small mammals, birds, frogs, etc., is that they didn't leave much behind in terms of a fossil record since then, which again, given the habitat of the sole extant genus of coelacanth, isn't really surprising. And um, the interesting thing about coelacanth is it's not found in shallow water, it's found in deep water. Unlike fossil coelacanths, and where we don't normally get many fossils anyway. And it doesn't creep along the bottom, it swims like any other fish. Yeah, because coelacanths, both before the end Cretaceous and now, are not on a line leading to terrestrial animals. They represent a lineage that stayed well adapted to life exclusively in the water. So it's just a really wonderful illustration of how wrong the fossil can be. It's a wonderful example of how wrong the fossils can be. Let's be generous and add in the word record there. So, so, it's a wonderful example of how wrong the fossil record can be. What's wrong about it? The fossil record is just all the fossils that have been found. The coelacanth is a Lazarus taxon, which is to say a taxon whose fossil record disappears at some point, only for them to show back up later in the fossil record, or today. This is a well-known phenomenon, and it is expected, unless Stanford here wants to argue that the fossil record contains all individual species ever to have lived on Earth, which I doubt he would. But before I tell you about how Darwin was wrong about the fossil record, I'd like to tell you something he was right about. And that was that he fully recognized that the fossil record of his day falsified his theory. No, it didn't. It just failed to sufficiently support it. So he says that in three places. The first one is he acknowledges the importance of the Cambrian explosion. He says, to question why we do not find rich fossiliferous deposits belonging to these assumed earlier periods before the Cambrian, I can give no satisfactory answer. So in order for this to matter, we'd have to show that, to this day, no Precambrian fossils of complex organisms that are nonetheless less complex than Cambrian organisms exist. Well, too bad the Adiacaran fossils exist, which are also sometimes called the Vendian biota, with organisms like Charnia, Nemacalathus, Dickinsonia, Spurgina, and Kimberella. He understood that the sudden emergence of life in Cambrian did not fit his model and there was no precursors that could have evolved into that, all those life forms. 
Good thing we know that the origin of life was billions of years earlier, and we have fossils from billions of years ago, and that the Eddie Curran does provide fossils of animals that fit the bill of being precursors to at least some Cambrian animals. Seems like this problem was basically solved, and solved as predicted by Darwin by just finding more fossils. Has every mystery about the beginning of the Cambrian been solved? No, but then there's no reason to say that if anything remains unknown about a subject, then what is known must be tossed out. That's absurd. With that standard, we would have to toss out literally all knowledge about anything. Furthermore, he, he acknowledges stasis, which means that life forms stay the same throughout the geological column. And so here's what he says. He says, the most eminent paleontologists, and he then lists the most eminent paleontologists of his time, and our greatest geologists, and he lists the greatest geologists of his time, have unanimously often vehemently maintained the immutability of species. I think it's worth quoting this whole paragraph in full. It's the last paragraph in chapter 9 of the 6th edition and reads as follows. Several difficulties here discuss, namely, that though we find in our geological formation many links between the species which now exist and formerly existed, we do not find infinitely numerous fine transitional forms closely joining them all together. The sudden manner in which several groups of species first appear in our European formations, the almost entire absence, as at present known, of formations rich in fossils beneath the Cambrian strata, are all undoubtedly of the most serious nature. We see this in the fact that the most eminent paleontologists, namely Cuvier, Agassiz, Barand, Pictet, Falconer, E. Forbes, etc., and all our greatest geologists, such as Lyle, Murchison, Sedgwick, etc., have unanimously, often vehemently, maintained the immutability of species. But Sir Charles Lyell now gives the support of his high authority to the opposite side, and most geologists and paleontologists are much shaken in their former belief. Those who believe that the geological record is in any degree perfect will undoubtedly at once reject my theory. For my part, following out Lyell's metaphor, I look at the geological record as a history of the world imperfectly kept and written in a changing dialect. Of this history, we possess the last volume alone, relating only to two or three countries. Of this volume, only here and there a short chapter has been preserved, and of each page, only here and there a few lines. Each word of the slowly changing language, more or less different in the successive chapters, may represent the forms of life which are entombed in our consecutive formations, and which falsely appear to have been abruptly introduced. On this view, the difficulties above discussed are greatly diminished or even disappear. Yeah, see, the thing is, Sanford is dishonestly quoting from the first edition. By the time of the 6th edition, some 13 years later, all these prominent geologists holding on to their idea of species fixity were not so sure anymore since the transitional forms had been found. See what I mean about Sanford being hard to take as an honest person? I, I actually didn't, this was really interesting for me to read because it means I thought that the, the, the Christians were talking about the immutability of species, but it was the geologists. Before the final edition, yeah, go on. Looking at the fossil record that made them realize that in the fossil, in deep time, or living types of animals did not change. They stayed the same. I think he's going to mention that some 13 years after the version he read that the geologists were reversing course on that? I'm betting no. That doesn't mean that, uh, you know, uh, small changes in adaptation don't happen, but it means that... Um... Actually, no, it does not mean that small adaptations don't happen. That's what species fixity means, and that's what, at the time of the publishing of the first edition of Origin of Species, geologists believed. Sanford is just trying to make it look like they agreed with him, when in fact they never did. This idea of Noah taking a small number of kinds which then evolve into modern diversity is a new idea, and no one before the mid-20th century had ever heard of it. The geologists of 1859 would all find Sanford's ideas even crazier than Darwin's. The geological record didn't support evolution. Funny how those same geologists thought it might very well support it in 1872, though, isn't it? And that is a trend that has not reversed since then. We basically have an unbroken chain of geology supporting evolution more and more from 1859. And so, most importantly, Darwin uh, describes this problem. He knows that evolution must happen slowly and gradually over lots of time. Well, gradualism was indeed one of Darwin's ideas. And while we can see gradualism in some lineages, like ceratopsians, sea sloths, and to some degree humans, in other lineages, interspecific gradualism is harder to detect while changes between higher taxa are easier to detect. This is why punctuated equilibrium was added to modern evolutionary theory. And so the fossil record should show that. So he asks, why then is not every geological stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against my theory. That's what he's saying. This is from paragraph one of chapter nine of the first edition. 
Let's check out the 6th edition to see where Darwin and geology were by the time he was done updating his book. Chapter numbers in this edition vary a bit from the first edition, so we're now in chapter 10, but it's the same chapter, on the imperfection of the geological record. The first paragraph reads as follows. In the sixth chapter, I enumerated the chief objections which might be justly urged against the views maintained in this volume, most of which have now been discussed. One, namely the distinctness of specific forms, and their not being blended together by innumerable transitional links, is a very obvious difficulty. I assigned reasons why such links do not commonly occur at the present day under the circumstances apparently most favorable for their presence, namely on an extensive and continuous area with graduated physical conditions. I endeavor to show that the life of each species depends in a more important manner on the presence of other already defined organic forms than on climate, and therefore that the really governing conditions of life do not graduate away quite insensibly like heat or moisture. I endeavored also to show that the intermediate varieties, from existing in lesser number than the forms which they connect, will generally be beaten out and exterminated during the course of further modification and improvement. The main cause, however, of innumerable intermediate links not now occurring everywhere throughout the nature depends on the very process of natural selection, through which new varieties continually take the places of and supplant their parent forms. But just in proportion to this process of extermination has acted on an enormous scale, so must the number of intermediate varieties which must have formerly existed be truly enormous. Why then is not every geological formation in every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against my theory. The explanation lies, as I believe, in the extreme imperfection of the geological record. Okay, so now we know what Darwin was saying in the first paragraph, but remember, this is the same edition where he ends this very chapter with Darwin pointing out that geologists are being forced to abandon the species fixity. This paragraph is like the first paragraph in an abstract. It's here to set up the problem so that the rest of the chapter, which is about fixing the problem or showing why it isn't one, has context. So, but he has a, he has a, he doesn't give up obviously. And so he has a solution to his problem. Here's the solution. The explanation lies, I believe, in the extreme imperfection of the geological record. In other words, give us more time and we'll find the missing links. So Darwin was absolutely wrong when he predicted that the fossil record, when complete, would support his theory. Let's remind ourselves of how this chapter ends. All our greatest geologists have unanimously, often vehemently, maintained the immutability of species. But Sir Charles Lyell now gives the support of his high authority to the opposite side, and most geologists and paleontologists are much shaken in their former belief. And why did this change? Well, because intermediate organisms were found. Those missing links were not all missing. Indeed, in 1861, years before the final edition of Origin of Species, Archaeopteryx was discovered, and despite Richard Owen's whining and outright lies and false predictions about it, it was obviously a transition between what was then thought of as reptiles and what was then thought of as birds. It had unfused wing fingers, unfused metatarsals, a long bony tail, no beak, teeth, its sternum didn't have a keel, its pubic bones came together under the ischial bones. Yet, for all that this made it look like a member of the only recently defined group Dinosauria, it also had feathers. And feathers are a trademark of birds. Since then, we haven't been stagnant in finding transitional forms. In fact, I think it's time for a montage. And so 150 years later, what is the total fossil count? There are too many fossils that have been collected to even calculate, perhaps billions.
Oh, it's way more than billions. Organic limestone is made up of microscopic fossils, so collecting one cubic centimeter of limestone yields you about 4.5 million fossils, assuming that all of the fossils are at the high end of the size for coccolithophores of 75 micrometers in diameter. You might not be shocked to know that the evolution of organisms like coccolithophores, which are single-celled eukaryotic phytoplankton, is easily traced through the sediment and in fact does yield what Darwin might call a finely graduated organic chain. There are roughly 250 million cataloged fossils and uh, according to a paper in Nature talking about the completeness of the fossil record, there is plenty of evidence now, plenty of fossils that have been recovered so that we do see the true and complete picture. Is that what it says? Because that paper only sampled the most common marine groups, which I will list exhaustively. Anthozoa, Asterozoa, Bibalbia, Brachiopoda, Byrozoa, Cephalopoda, Chondrichthys, Crinoidea, Echinoidea, Gastropoda, Malacostraca, Ostracoda, Polycheta, and Porifera. Notice that there are no tetrapods, no plants, not even any bony fish. This is a study about the completeness of the marine fossil record, mostly of invertebrate animals, but the completeness measures from about 5% chance of any given polychaete genus being preserved to an over 90% chance of any brachiopod being preserved. And wouldn't you know it, we have a lot of wonderful transitional forms of brachiopods, but creations don't care about brachiopods, because first, they can't usually tell the difference between them and bivalves, and second, they're not cool animals that you see at the zoo like lions or tigers. But other well-preserved lineages include bivalvia and bryozoa, while Malacostraca and Asterozoa are in the range where the vast majority of genera should be completely missing from the fossil record. This paper in no way says what Dr. Sanford says it does, that we have a complete fossil record. Sure, we have a basically complete brachiopod fossil record, but we definitely have a very incomplete record in other cases. But do we have enough to see the big picture? Well, yes, I think we do. And the thing is, so do most paleontologists. It's just that the essentially universal consensus is that it's fully in line with common ancestry and evolution. And no one, Sanford included, seems to come up with the anti-evolution idea based on the evidence only to find that, to their surprise, that puts them in league with the Christians. Instead, they find themselves having a conversion experience and then finding that their interpretation of Christianity is incompatible with the evidence-based ideas from science, and so deciding that their religion is more important than the actual evidence. So then they move away from evidence-based science and into pseudoscience. On the, on the grand scale. And the picture is not what Darwin needed. Do I really need to do it again? Okay, I guess I do, but we'll speed it up this time. Let's just look at two, two quotes that illustrate this. Stephen Jay Gould, a famous evolutionist and paleontologist, says the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the fossil record. Oh hey look, little Johnny found a Stephen Jay Gould quote mine, and from 1977 too. Since this is more than four decades old, let's just quote Talk Origins, as if Sanford thinks that 40 year old plus quotes are a great idea, I think 10 plus year old debunks are sufficient. A more complete quote would be as follows. The extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. Yet Darwin was so wedded to gradualism that he wagered his entire theory on a denial of this literal record. The geological record is extremely imperfect, and this fact will to a large extent explain why we do not find interminable varieties connecting together all the extinct and existing forms of life by the finest graduated steps. He who rejects these views on the nature of geological record will rightly reject my whole theory. Darwin's argument persists as a favorite escape of most paleontologists from the embarrassment of a fossil record that seems to show so little of evolution directly. In exposing its cultural and methodological roots, I wish in no way to impugn on the potential validity of gradualism, 
for all general views have similar roots. I only wish to point out that it is never seen in the rocks. Paleontologists have paid an exorbitant price for Darwin's argument. We fancy ourselves as the only true students of life's history, yet to preserve our favorite account of evolution by natural selection, we view our data as so bad that we never see the very process we profess to study. For several years, Niles Eldridge of the American Museum of Natural History and I, that is Stephen Jay Gould, have been advocating a resolution to this uncomfortable paradox that does not require gradual change. In fact, the operation of Charles Darwin's process should yield exactly what we see in the fossil record. It is gradualism we should reject, not Darwinism. So it would seem that Gould had no problems with the fossil record, but did he believe that transitional forms are lacking? Note that in the quote originally presented, the claim is made that they are rare, not absent. Also, as anyone who is familiar with Gould's writings will know, the text quoted reflects his recognition that, while there is a scarcity of transitional fossils between species, there is no such lack of transitional fossils between major groups. Yet again, this is Gould discussing punctuated equilibria. It is best, perhaps simply, to allow Gould to defend himself as he did in his article Evolution as Fact and Theory, originally published in 1981. Quote, transitions are often found in the fossil record. Preserved transitions are not common and should not be, according to our understanding of evolution, see next section, but they are not entirely wanting, as creationists often claim. He then discusses two examples, therapsid intermediaries between reptiles and mammals and the half dozen human species found as of 1981 that appear in an unbroken temporal sequence as progressively more modern features. Faced with these facts of evolution and the philosophical bankruptcy of their own position, Creationists rely upon distortion and innuendo to buttress their rhetorical claim. If I sound sharp or bitter, indeed I am, for I have become a major target of these practices. I count myself among the evolutionists who argue for a jerky or episodic rather than a smoothly gradual pace of change. In 1972, my colleague Niles Eldridge and I developed the theory of punctuated equilibrium. We argued that two outstanding facts of the fossil record, geologically sudden origin of new species, and failure to change thereafter, stasis, reflect the predictions of evolutionary theory, not the imperfections of the fossil record. In most theories, small isolated populations are the source of new species, and the process of speciation takes thousands or tens of thousands of years. This amount of time, so long when measured against our lives, is a geological microsecond. Since we propose punctuated equilibria to explain trends, it is infuriating to be quoted again and again by creationists, whether through design or stupidity, I do not know, as admitting that the fossil record includes no transitional forms. Transitional forms are generally lacking at the species level, but they are abundant between larger groups. End quote. That's from Gould, Stephen Jay, 1983, Evolutionist Fact and Theory, in Hen's Teeth and Horse's Toes, Further Reflections on Natural History, New York, W.W. W. Norton and Company, page 258 through 260. Gould in this article and in many more over the next 20 years consistently and extensively explained his position and the evidence for evolution, including transitional forms found in the fossil record. The constant abuse of the body of Gould's life work in the face of this is not merely dishonest, it is despicable. And all of that was written by John Catshark Pire and John Augre Barber between 2004 and 2006. So a question I would have for Dr. Sanford, or for Sal by proxy, is why is Dr. Sanford dishonestly quoting Stephen Jay Gould to imply that he thought that the fossil record did not support evolution? That's a pretty strong statement that, uh, that there's no missing links. Except that you know that that's a damn lie, Sanford. I'll be honest, given Sanford's credentials and in the high regard he's held in by creationists, I figured he would be a cut above. I thought that this talk would actually make me have to really dig. Instead, no, we get the same disgusting, dishonest dribble that we get from people like Ken Ham. Why does a Cornell professor think it's okay to flat out lie about a scientist? Why does Sal speak so highly of this man? I guess it's at least comforting to know that the rule that you can only be at most two among honest, well-informed, and creationists holds true, and that Sanford is well-informed, creationist, but clearly not honest. And uh, again, uh, Eldred, uh, Eldridge and Tattersall, two famous uh, evolutionists, uh, they say 120 years of paleontological research later, it has become abundantly clear that the fossil record will not confirm this part of Darwin's predictions. Oh, fun. Another quote mine from people who definitely think the fossil record supports evolution. Well, since this is still ancient, back to talk origins. In the passages quoted, Eldridge and Tattersall are discussing the merits of gradualism, something the quote miner has left out, as we can see. Quote, the main impetus for expanding the view that species are discrete at any one point in time to embrace their entire life history comes from the fossil record. Paleontologists 
just were not seeing the expected changes in their fossils as they pursued them up through the rock record. Instead, collections of nearly identical specimens, separated in some cases by 5 million years, suggested that the overwhelming majority of animal and plant species were tremendously conservative throughout their histories. That individual kinds of fossils remain recognizably the same throughout the length of their occurrence of the fossil record had been known to paleontologists long before Darwin published his origin. Darwin himself, troubled by the stubbornness of the fossil record and refusing to yield abundant examples of gradual change, devoted two chapters to the fossil record. To preserve his argument, he was forced to assert the fossil record was too incomplete, too full of gaps to produce the expected pattern of change. He prophesied that future generations of paleontologists would fill in these gaps by diligent search, and then his major thesis that evolutionary change is gradual and progressive would be vindicated. 120 years of paleontological research later, it has become abundantly clear that the fossil record will not confirm this part of Darwin's predictions. Nor is the problem a miserably poor record. The fossil record simply shows that his prediction is wrong. The observation that species are amazingly conservative and static entities throughout long periods of time has all the qualities of the emperor's new clothes. Everyone knew it, but preferred to ignore it. Paleontologists, faced with a recalcitrant record, obstinately refusing to yield to Darwin's predicted pattern, simply looked the other way. Rather than change the well-entrenched evolutionary theory, paleontologists tacitly agreed with their zoological colleagues that the fossil record was too poor to do much beyond supporting, in a general sort of way, the basic thesis that life has evolved. Note the claim that the fossil record supports evolution. This again is from John Augre Pire between 2003 and 2005. So again, we're just arguing against Darwinian gradualism, and both Eldridge and Tattersall agree that the fossil record supports evolution on the whole, and of course, as advocates for punctuated equilibrium, they are overstating the completeness of the fossil record and understating the prevalence of transitionals, which is why now the consensus is that there is some merit to punctuated equilibrium, but that gradualism is also observed in some lineages. So guess what? The thing that Darwin considered the best evidence against his theory still is the best evidence against his theory. According to none of the five people referenced. Like, I can't stress this enough. He quoted from the work of five different authors in three different works to say that the fossil record doesn't support evolution, and none of them say that evolution isn't supported by the fossil record. Literally, none of them. Hey, you know what Psalm 14 1 says? It says, There is no God. Deuteronomy 32 39 says, There is no God with me. 1 Kings 8 23 also says, There is no God. 2 Kings 1 6 says, There is no God in Israel. 2 Chronicles 6 14 also says, There is no God. Psalm 3 3 says, There is no help in God. Psalm 53 1 says, There is no God. Isaiah 44, 6 says there is no God. Isaiah 45, 5 says there is no God. Isaiah 45, 21 again says there is no God. Hosea 4, 1 says there is no truth. Hosea 13, 4 says there is no Savior. Micah 3, 7 says there is no answer of God. Clearly, Christianity, which is a theistic religion, can't be right because even its own holy book says that there is no God, there is no truth, and there is no Savior. But Christianity thinks that Jesus is God, truth, and Savior. Except, oh wait. None of those verses actually say that in context. All of those verses do contain those words in that order in the KJV, but I had to slog through hundreds of verses I couldn't quote mine, and even the ones I could all actually say the opposite of the small bits I pulled out of them. In fact, in most of them, the character saying, there is no God, is actually God, and he follows up with something like, besides me. Can you see, creationists, why maybe this isn't a good tactic? Maybe being so blatantly dishonest doesn't really make people want to join your religion if it's inspiring such behavior. So now what we have is on the uh, left, we have the actual fossil record. What's the source for this? Right, he made it up. Which shows no cross-linking between kinds and no common ancestor. Actually, as the quotes that we were given show, the fossil record actually does show links between higher taxa. That is, taxa like families and higher. What it doesn't tend to show is transitions between species in the same genus or family. You know, the only kind of evolution Sanford accepts. So far from being a problem for evolution, this is a problem for young earth creationism. And we see stasis through the entire geological column, suggesting that things don't evolve, they stay the same. Literally the opposite conclusion made by every single source we've been given here. And of course, it's that time again. <laughs> Yeah,
So yeah, not sure how we're going to conclude the puzzle record, which is chock full of transitions, just not always the ones that a gradualist would want, is not a support for evolution. Of course, I also look forward to Sanford's attempt to explain the fossil record using a flood. And on the right, we have what Darwin was speculating would have happened, what he was hoping the fossil record would show, and what the fossil record fails to show. Yeah, gradualism in a complete fossil record. But we know that gradualism is not always a good assumption. And from the various sources Sanford used to say that the fossil record is complete, we know it's not, at least not for all taxa. And so this is a huge problem for Darwin. Maybe, but is it a problem for modern evolutionary theory? You know, the thing that doesn't care about Darwin? No, no it's not. Um, Darwin was wrong about the tree of life. And so for this icon, we selected a page from Darwin's notebook where he scribbled the words, I think, and then a little cartoon with branches, which is his version of the tree of life. Why use the word cartoon here? Let's look at the basic definition for a cartoon from Wikipedia, because we can be fairly certain that what's there is going to be just what most English speakers think a cartoon is. Quote, a cartoon is a type of visual art that is typically drawn, frequently animated, in unrealistic or semi-realistic style. The specific meaning has evolved over time, but the modern usage usually refers to either an image or series of images intended for satire, caricature, or humor, or a motion picture that relies on a sequence of illustrations for its animation, end quote. Hmm. I'm pretty sure that this single image isn't intended for satire, caricature, or humor, and it's certainly not a motion picture. So the only reason I can see to call this a cartoon is to poison the well. Also note that when Sanford made up a diagram from whole cloth, he did not call it a cartoon. Now, when I was, uh, uh, when I was an evolutionist, I would have said this was one of the best evidences for evolution, the tree of life. Hopefully, he means like the actual evident common ancestry that all life on Earth shares, and not Darwin's sketch of an idea from a notebook. Let's consider it. Let's go back to this picture again. The actual fossil record doesn't show a tree, does it? I think he means, let's go back to this cartoon he made up one day. And what would it look like for the fossil record to show a tree? These cartoons, because that's how I'm going to start referring to anything he puts up but doesn't cite, are based on charts showing different kinds of data. So just the comparison is dishonest. The one on the left looks like a chart that shows the geological and therefore temporal range of various taxa. Each red line would be some taxon with a name, and no matter if it changes or not, it would just be a red line with some vertical extent. In fact, all taxa do change throughout time, but this chart is fundamentally unable to show this. In fact, actual charts like this don't have any morphology access. They don't technically have an x-axis. Instead, it's just a list of taxa in some order. Sometimes they're arranged the way they might have been in a cladogram, but other times they're just alphabetical or some other way of arranging them. The chart on the right is basically a cladogram showing an approximation of morphological diversity and the approximate extent of the taxa. But the problem is that on these charts, you can't actually put numbers on the axes, in no small part because you can't measure morphology one-dimensionally. You need far more dimensions than you could ever reasonably display to put morphology orthogonal to time. And with cladograms, the node points are not named taxa, because cladistic analysis and phylogenetic analysis both start with the assumption that all taxa under consideration are endpoints, and then they generate the most well-supported tree according to various criteria, such as fewest branch numbers, parsimony, etc. Pretending that these are something you can compare with no source and without even explaining what charts like this are supposed to show is just dishonest. But we need a tree. So if you're a committed Darwinist and you realize the fossil record's not going to help you, you're going to have to find another way to show evidence for this tree of life with a common, single common ancestor. Well, it's going to help, but it's only one line of evidence. There is also the genetics that shows quite conclusively that all life forms whose genomes we've studied share common ancestry. How do you do that? Well, there's a science called phylogeny, and perhaps Darwin's tree of life might be saved through the science of phylogeny. What does that mean? Yep, it can. Because if organisms did not have a common ancestor, 
we can predict what a phylogenetic analysis would recover for that group of organisms that lacks a common ancestor. Let's see if it's actually mentioned. It means that you, you make observations of all the living species. Nope, phylogenetic analysis is done on extinct species too, but it's not normally done on my subscribers. So if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and do so, lest you be the subject of phylogenetic analysis. And if you want to help me get my animations done quickly, just go to sheepitrenderfarm.com, go to the Get Started page, download the client appropriate to your operating system, use the login credentials in the description of this video, and you'll be rendering on my behalf. Do be aware that this will cost extra electricity, so if your power bill is a concern, perhaps give this a pass. Also, be aware that the password isn't my password, it's a public key, so it won't give you access to any of my accounts. Which represent the top of that tree. Nope. You would include the branches that terminate before the top of the tree if possible, because there's no requirement that all taxa in question be extant. And then you use the similarities and differences between living species to infer or guess how the branching structure might have been. No, it's not a guess. You don't just eyeball it. There are actual rigorous mathematical measurements and statistics to be run. In fact, the same way that evolutionary biology determines the relationship between larger taxa are used by creationists to determine the relationships within what they think of as kinds. The same way a creationist would try to determine that wolves, coyotes, golden jackals, and Maine wolves have a common ancestor shows just as well that wolves, bears, seals, and raccoons have a common ancestor, or that wolves, pangolins, horses, and cows do too. Okay, so the idea of phylogeny is anything, the stuff in your kitchen, the stuff in your garage, your wardrobe, all things can be grouped naturally based upon their similarities and differences. No, that's not the idea, and he damn well knows that. Phylogeny is based on the idea of derived differences, and the absolute brute fact that we know from genetics that when you inherit genes from ancestors, it carries with it the traits associated with those genes, and the changes in a lineage are inherited by descendants within that lineage. This is true for living things and not true for inanimate objects. And so phylogeny is this attempt to infer the past based upon modern day similarities and past similarities because, again, extinct organisms aren't excluded. And the bottom line is, you can't know the past by looking at just what's alive today. Actually, you can, at least in part. And we don't look only at the present, but yeah, if you can't infer the past by looking at today, then I guess all of history and forensic science, but also the Bible, are useless to determining what happened in the past. Luckily for everyone, including Christians, that's not how anything works. So the early phylogenies, uh, or trees of life were just fanciful cartoons. Ah yes, once again using the word cartoon to poison the well, as if stylizing these charts for lay folks somehow invalidates them. So they were just, you know, well, it seems to me that bir birds should be on one branch and mammals should be another branch and amphibians should be on a branch, and so they'd make these fanciful cartoons. Uh, and, and that was back in the 19th century. And here in the 21st century, we actually base this on rigorous studies including fossil information, DNA, rigorous statistical analyses, etc. So criticism of these non-rigorous drawings from more than a century ago to our current understanding of phylogenetics is either stupid beyond comprehension or it's entirely dishonest. Hey Sal, once again, if you're watching this, please let me know why your pal is doing this. And as time passed, the cartoons got more and more stylized and they, they called them cladograms and... and uh... I'm sorry, what's the deal with being stylized? And cladograms aren't exactly the same thing as phylogenies, but it's close enough that I'm not going to nitpick here. Also, how is that last chart more stylized than the ones that used actual trees? What you see is there's these, we have living things on the top and we have lines down the bottom. The living things are things we actually observe. The lines are things we imagine. We imagine in the same way we imagine protons. You can't go grab a jar of protons. You can't look at them. You can't say what color they are or how they taste but their existence is clear from the effect they have on the world that we can detect, and their presence is the only thing that makes sense of our observations about atoms. Similarly, the existence of common ancestors isn't something you can usually go out and take a picture of, except in cases of very recent speciation events. But their presence is seen in things like the pattern of inherited neutral variation, the distribution of both homologies and analogies, the transitional forms we do indeed have in the fossil record, etc. Their existence is the only thing that makes sense of the data we have about living organisms. As Theodosius Dobzhansky once said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So you can maybe see that uh, you could draw other branching structures beneath the living things. 
You could, but they wouldn't make sense, except in the case of swapping out the mouse and the chimp, since those are the only two branches on this whole chart that are sisters to each other. So let's swap some. I'm a nerd, so I have some d8s handy, and there are seven options, so I'll roll a pair of d8s four times, and I'll reroll if I get doubles, eights, or seven and eights, since that's a trivial swap. The results are 5, 1, 7, 3, 3, 2, 1, 4. So first, that's swapping the pigeon and the hagfish, then the chimp and the perch, then the salamander and the perch, and finally the hagfish and the lizard. Now for this exercise, I'm going to go with the wider taxa. So hagfish will be agnathan fish, perch will be actinopterygian fish, the salamander will be lys amphibia, the lizard will be squamates, the pigeon will be dinosaurs, the mouse will be rodents, and the chimp will be primates. Now the first thing to note is the diagram is actually wrong. It should be like this with the lizard and the pigeon sharing a common ancestor, since pigeons are closer to lizards than either are to mice. And believe it or not, this is the most high quality version of this cladogram I could find, despite the dither. So anyway, let's do this. First, correct the error with pigeons and lizards. Okay, now that that's done, let's look at swapping birds and jawless fish. Well, this would be a very strange hypothesis, with the hagfish being more like a lizard than a lizard is like a mouse. The hagfish, which doesn't have bones, a jaw, which has gills, is clearly not very much like a lizard. Whereas for the bird to be the outgroup, we would have to assume that it independently evolved four limbs, lungs, a jaw, etc., and that those just happen to match the embryological development of all the other animals except the hagfish, which must have lost all those things independently. That's clearly a worse option. Well, maybe swapping primates and lysamphibians will do better. So here at least we have all of our animals being able to share the development of lungs, a spine, and jaws. But we also have some problems. Hagfish and perch have larval stages almost exactly like that of the salamander whereas the chimps, lizards, and pigeons, and mice all have amniotic development with no larval stage that is free living. Further, both the mouse and the chimp share fur, mammary glands, placental reproduction, dentary school muscle jaw joints, etc, etc, etc. So the implication here would be that chimps and mice independently derive all of the features of mammals. Clearly this seems wrong, so let's not assume that one. Next we'll see how we do with switching the perch and the salamander. Well, we have a problem with limbs here. Why is it the perch's fins have such a different form and development from the other groups closer to it compared to the salamander? While the salamander has those same limbs. Similarly, amphibians have things like a neck, which is shared by the birds and other tetrapods on here, but not by the perch. So I guess perch never developed limbs or a neck, but amniotes and lys amphibians develop developmentally identical necks and limbs. Again, this is not a parsimonious result. Well, last but not least, let's try hagfish and the lizard. Essentially, we have the same problems with legs and necks and fins as before, but now we have to wonder how the hagfish also lost a bony skeleton and jaws entirely, while its closest relative, the birds, did not, or how it managed to re-evolve gills, while the lizard just happened to evolve all the trace of amniotes, despite being less closely related to them than is a ray fin fish. See, that's the thing, you can't just draw any shape under these. There is only one way to arrange these that actually fits with the data. And it's so obvious that this is the case that this idea predates Darwin by 124 years. Carolus Linnaeus, from whom we get the term Linnaean taxonomy, noticed that there were objectively nested hierarchies in living things that are unlike those found in man-made things, and he described most of the taxa in plants and animals that are still being used, including things like aves, mammalia, carnivora, primates, etc. The relationship between Linnaeus and Darwin is like that between Newton and Einstein. Linnaeus and Newton noticed a consistent pattern in nature and described it in a way that remains useful even today, although in some details we need to make corrections to both. Darwin and Einstein both came up with a theoretical framework to explain these patterns in nature. Newton observed that mass was attracted to mass proportional to the sum of the masses, and inversely proportional to the distance between them. Einstein realized that this was because mass curves space-time towards itself, and that objects follow the geodesic of a local curvature of space-time, which results in masses falling towards each other, with a force proportional to their sun mass and inversely proportional to their distance. Linnaeus realized that there were right and wrong ways to organize living things, and that all living things fell into an objective nested hierarchy, where any member of a lower taxa was also a member of all higher taxa, but he didn't know why. Darwin realized that it was because these taxa actually represent the descendants of common ancestors, and so no matter how far into the future a taxon goes, since it can't ever evolve to not be a descendant of its ancestors, Nature automatically produces these nested hierarchies by descent with modification. Playing with tools in your garage or the silverware in your kitchen will not get you anything close to this, no matter how much creationists would like to whine that it does. Or you might not have them linking up at all. Now that's an interesting idea. What if there were no objectively more correct way to arrange organisms? Which is what we should expect if they do not share common ancestry, just common design. 
We might have bats with feathery wings or lizards with lion teeth. That will result in an inability to link organisms. And if that were to be the case, any phylogenetic analysis run on such organisms would simply return only extremely low confidence trees because the point of statistics run on such trees is to show how likely a tree is to have been generated randomly rather than being an actual representation of the relationship between the organisms. In a case where organisms were not related, then such trees should all return being far more likely to be chance than not. The very fact that this does not occur means that life absolutely is arranged the way that we would expect if shared common ancestry were true, and is absolutely not arranged the way we might expect it if it was not true. Unless the creator just wanted to fool us into thinking it did evolve. Since I prefer not to let an omnipotent liar into my epistemology for the sake of, you know, even having an epistemology, I must reject that option out of hand. The universe is to be treated as if God, should he exist, is not lying to us. And so the very fact that concordant high-confidence trees can be constructed is evidence of the reality of common descent. I just want to emphasize, I want you to understand that um, the whole scientific community went berserk over the idea of making these trees, these trees. And so tens of thousands of scientists spent their whole career making these trees. They made hundreds of thousands of trees. I remember going, being in the Cornell Library and just paging through the bi biology journals, and it was just one after another of these trees. Yeah, it's almost like this is the basic unifying idea of biology. It's like being surprised to see stratigraphic columns in geology papers, or stellar spectra in astronomy papers. All these, all these data points, there, are, there, are, there is data here. These aren't just pretend. How magnanimous of him to mention. But they're just measuring similarities and differences between living things. And then they're drawing lines, which are just educated guesses. Backed up by data, but whatever. Sanford's just repeating himself here. We'll come back after he gets to a new point. Now, the problem with um, this is that, uh, like I said, you can make a phylogeny of any set of objects. Go into the kitchen, take the utensils drawer, dump it out, and, and, and then start look at all the stuff that's in there, all kinds of interesting things, and you'll notice that some things are more similar than others. And so if you take 10 different people and have them categorize these and start making measurements of how different and similar things are, what you'd have is each one of them would come up with their own groupings, and each one of them would have their own history of where utensils came from. So do it. Seriously, creationists, I'm so sick of this claim that you never actually back up. Write up that paper complete with all your data and all your math on kitchenware phylogenetics. Show what kinds of p-values you get on your parsimony-based phylogenetics, etc. See if it's reproducible. Then compare notes with the same thing being done in evolution. If you can get the same level of statistical significance, then you can say that maybe you have a point that high-confidence phylogenetic analysis is just silliness, since you can get that reproducibly with stuff in your kitchen drawer. I'm waiting. I already showed that you can't just arrange organisms randomly into a phylogeny, and that's something we've known about for about three centuries. So you've had a long time to do the same thing with man-made objects, and yet you haven't. You don't even try. This is the laziest bullshit at the creationist pull. Stop pretending that it's my job to test your shit and go do it yourself if you're so damn confident. But we know you won't. Because either right on the surface, you're just dishonest, or deep down in your consciousness where you don't like to look because that's the part that has doubts, you suspect it's all nonsense, and you can't let yourself think about that. And this, of course, ignores the simple fact that we can watch both new species come about and new kitchenware items, and they don't do it in the same way. Organisms observably evolve in real time before our eyes. Forks and spoons are observably made in human factories. If forks could fornicate and produce babies which inherit traits from both parents with the new variations, then maybe this might be an interesting analogy. But they don't, and you all know it. And so some of them would say, egg beaters came from spoons. And others would say, no, egg beaters came from chopsticks. But you see, it just depends on how, what measurements they chose to take. Yeah, that would happen with kitchen gadgets. Weird then how you give phylogeneticists, a group of animals like hagfish, a perch, a salamander, a lizard, a pigeon, and a mouse, and a chimpanzee, and they all manage to get the same phylogeny. Weird then how even when they disagree about the placement of a branch here or there, there is still a wide consensus. This isn't a whole contingent of scientists arguing that apes are actually closer to elephants than they are to capybaras. They all agree that they're way closer to capybaras. No one is wondering whether a falcon is more like a parrot or a chickadee. Everyone knows it's the parrot. No one has to scratch their head about if an aardwolf is a hyena or a fox. Everyone in the field knows it's a hyena. Why is that? Why is there such broad agreement if, like Sanford says, you can just draw whatever tree under the animals you want depending on what measurements you take? Like you can with kitchenware. 
It's almost like this whole claim is nonsense and the kind of thing it doesn't take a PhD in biology to figure out. And that's exactly what's seen with these biological phylogenies is depending on who's making the tree and what measurements they choose to take to, to measure similarities and differences, they, they keep getting the same. They keep getting the same results. Yes, they do. Why is he lying about that? Analyzing the same objects and getting different phylogenetic trees. Oh, it was a Freudian slip. Yeah, that checks out. Pretty obvious Sanford knows better and is just lying for Jesus. You know, if your theology were true, you wouldn't have to lie about verifiable facts to support it. Just saying. Because it's highly arbitrary. Except, you know, it's not. Because in many cases, phylogenetic analyses are highly reproducible. This is in contrast to the creation equivalent, pheromonology, which has a serious problem with reproducibility because, spoiler alert, the people doing pheromonology as a rule don't care what's true, they're seeking to confirm what they already think is true. By God's grace, uh, in 2009, a new scientist came out with an issue that dealt with this problem in depth. And here's the cover of their uh, issue. And it says on the cover of the new scientist, Darwin was wrong. And it says, cutting down the tree of life. And basically, the whole article talks about the, our inability to create a legitimate tree of life and know how thing, who came from what and how they might have had a common ancestor. Good to know you're lying about this source, too. Uh, you are a rotten liar. So what's this actually talking about? Well, it's noting that at the base of the tree of life, horizontal gene transfer, that is, exchange of genetic material from relatively unrelated organisms during the course of an organism's life and not associated with any instance of reproduction, was so prevalent that it becomes hard to create branching diagrams. And here's the thing. That's a real problem, and it may not have an easy solution. But you know what it's not about? Anything that could be a problem for ideas like the universal ancestry of all eukaryotes. That is everything from an amoeba to a mushroom to a pine tree to an elephant. But Sanford here needs to disrupt common ancestry of humans and chimpanzees. Pointing out that the neat branching phylogenies are hard to make and the taxa under consideration are things like all organisms with a nucleus and all bacteria doesn't in any way negate the extremely high confidence of, say, primate phylogenies, which routinely and reproducibly connect humans and genus Pan as sister lineages, and that group as a sister to gorilla. As an analogy, imagine if you're trying to follow a cake recipe, but Sanford comes up and asks you if you can explain the entire life cycle and nitrogen fixation path of Klebicelia pneumoniae, and says that if you can't, then you should probably stop baking a cake, because it's impossible. You, being not a completely insane person, ask him, The f*** are you talking about? He responds, well, a study pointed out that a particular species of bacteria provides nitrogen fixation to wheat, and without that, wheat couldn't grow, and then you wouldn't get flour to bake your cake. Of course, your response is that it doesn't really matter at this point how the process of making a cake started that far back in the process. You have flour, eggs, salt, butter, baking powder, sugar, vanilla, and milk, and that no matter where all that came from at this point, they will combine just fine into a cake batter, which will bake up into a cake, and that every time someone gets all these ingredients, combines them in the same amounts, and bakes in the same way, they get a cake. Of course, Sanford says, you're just being arbitrary. And then you tell him to leave your kitchen, or you'll have him arrested for trespassing and criminal stupidity. Hmm. Maybe I shouldn't be writing the script before breakfast. Anyway, even if we were all to accept that this trouble, way at the base of the Tree of Life, meant that those areas where there are no simple consensus trees mean that there was no common ancestry, it still leaves us with humans sharing common ancestry with jellyfish. So the latest research shows that the tree of life, Darwin's tree of life, is coming down. Is it though, or does it just have a confusing root structure? And so here's, a, here's a, a, one, of the, one of the people who was, a scientist who was interviewed in that uh, article was uh, a famous uh, phylogenist named Doolittle, and he had a, they were citing an earlier paper called Uprooting the Tree of Life, published in Scientific American. Oh look, a chart showing exactly what I said. That it's crazy and complicated because of horizontality right at the base, but that after that it continues up without such chaos. Good to know for sure that Mr. Sanford is just a liar. And this is his view of the Tree of Life. He said, it's a hopeless mess. You can't see a branching structure. It's just a tangle. And he called it the web of life. What he means is there's no way to decipher what that branching structure, historically, what the branching structure was. Yeah, but he's not saying that about what comes after the base. We can all tell this is just lies. Let's just sample some of the text, shall we? 
From the opening section, we get, To everyone's surprise, discoveries made in the past few years have begun to cast serious doubt on some aspects of the tree, especially on the depiction of the relationships near the root. Hmm, interesting. On page 94, closer to the end of the article, we have, If there had never been any lateral transfer, all these individual gene trees would have the same topology, the same branching order, and the ancestral genes at the root of each tree would have all been present in the genome of the last universal common ancestor, a single ancient cell. But extensive transfer means that neither is the case. Gene trees will differ, although many will have regions of similar topology, and there would never have been a single cell that could be called the last universal common ancestor. Gee, it's almost like all of this is so far upstream of what Sanford needs it to be that it's pointless, and still, even the authors don't think that this is actually showing the consensus tree has nothing to it, just that many genes have a different tree because of all this horizontal gene transfer. And in the conclusion on page 95, we read, The ancestor cannot have been a particular organism or a single organismal lineage. It was communal, a loosely knit, diverse conglomeration of primitive cells that evolved as a unit, and it eventually developed to a stage where it broke into several distinct communities, which in turn become the three primary lines of descent, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. Oh, so after this initial high rate of universal horizontal gene transfer, we got distinct lineages, not a continuation of the confusing patterns. Gee, funny how so far every source Sanford has used would disagree with not only his conclusions, but even what the source itself is trying to say. It's almost like he's a dishonest hack, but what do I know? I'm just a ceratosaurus. I bite the head off of sauropods. Stephen Jay Gould. Nope, we're not doing another Stephen Jay Gould quote mine. Sanford has too often lied about his sources, including already about Gould. We're not letting him drag Gould's corpse through the mud again on this channel. That's enough disrespect for Gould for one video series. The first time was already disgusting enough, and yeah, Sanford, if you're watching, you are a disgusting little toad who has to blatantly lie to be taken seriously. It's just Gould saying the same thing about how at the base of a tree many genes have phylogenetic trees that does not have the same topology as the consensus tree for the lineages as a whole. And yeah, not only is that true, it doesn't help Sanford's case at all. You know, in the textbooks that make it look like these trees are scientific and that they're proof. They are scientific because they were constructed according to the scientific method and are reproducible to a high degree. But they are not proof, they are the conclusions of studies. When virtually anyone looks at the data and tries to figure it out, they get the same tree, which becomes a consensus. I'm still waiting for that level of rigor and reproducibility from Samford's promised kitchenware phylogeny paper. Uh, in reality, similarities and differences in the present don't tell us the past. Some of my audience might be familiar with the fact that websites exist that collect genealogical information such as census results, birth records, baptismal records, etc. from around the world, and that not all of them are even run by Mormons. You might also know that some of them offer DNA testing, and that the results, in addition to being mailed to the customer, are kept in a database, which also allows them to alert people when their relatives upload DNA, especially if those relatives are not yet linked on a genealogy. When this happens, the two individuals can compare genealogical notes and are often able to find a previously unknown common ancestor, such as a great-great-grandparent. This is entirely based on the same idea as phylogenies, especially molecular phylogenies, which concentrate on things like protein sequence and genetics. If current genetic similarities did not give evidence of past events, then how is it that people can use their genetic data to find relatives on that basis alone and then also find out exactly how they are related, complete with a name, a birth date, and a death date in many cases for their common ancestor? Of course, this process can use present data to tell us about the past, and it does so routinely, not just in genealogical research, but also in forensics when crimes have been committed. Criminals have been identified without having the criminal's DNA, but only that of a relative. Similarly, the case of the Somerton man was recently solved with the help of DNA, although at the time of this writing, the South Australia police have not confirmed this. The Somerton man case concerned the body of an unidentified man who washed ashore on the beach at Somerton Park near Adelaide, South Australia. He had no ID on him, and no one came forward to identify him. There was much speculation about him, and possibly a nurse that he may have had an affair with, as her son had genetic peculiarities that he also shared. This hypothesis on its own is based on the fact that we can see current similarities and infer past events. Fortunately for the world, when a plaster cast was made of the Somerton man's bust in hopes that it might someday be used to identify him, some of his hair was left behind in the bust. Professor Derek Abbott and genealogist Colleen M. Fitzpatrick got access to this hair and used DNA analysis along with genealogical DNA databases to finally identify the man as Charles Webb. This was done by also getting DNA samples from potential descendants and relatives to compare against. So, is Sanford right that all of this is nonsense? 
No, of course not. We all know that DNA is evidence of ancestry. So how far back do we go? Can the DNA matches between all humans be used to infer universal human common ancestry? Well, I should think so, and Samper would agree. But the same data shows that humans share common ancestry with all primates. And when I say it shows it, let me quote some of the paper Statistical Evidence for Common Ancestry, Application to Primates by Baum et al. published in Evolution on May 3, 2016. This is from the discussion. Every test of species separate ancestry that we apply to the primates suggested that this model does a very poor job of explaining actual biological data as compared to common ancestry. Many of these data sets reject species separate ancestry strongly. The probability of obtaining a test statistic more extreme than the one observed under the species separate ancestry model being incredibly small, often approaching or greatly exceeding the probability of picking the correct atom at random among the estimated 10 to the 80th atoms in the known universe. This uniform and strong signal arises in part from the large number of primate species for which data is available. In the case of family-separate ancestry, the fact that there are only 16 living primate families greatly reduces statistical power. Nonetheless, except in cases where we study a single trait across families, e.g. chromosome number, testes relative weight, etc., tests of family-separate ancestry have showed extremely strong support for common ancestry. When they talk about these statistics, they have used p-values. P-value can be thought of as the chance of the data in question happens to support the hypothesis simply by random chance. The smaller it is, the more strongly the hypothesis is accepted, and the more strongly the null hypothesis, in this case separate ancestry, that is special creation, is rejected. In some cases, the p-value reported is zero. In other words, so small that their statistical methods cannot recover values that small. When they can, they get numbers like 10 to the negative 1,700. But that is a zero followed by a decimal point, followed by 1,700 zeros, then a one. That's the chance of separate ancestry being the cause of the observed data. Finally, the last paragraph is, in writing this article, we hope to stimulate more work on statistical evidence for common ancestry. Not because there is any scientific doubt about the veracity of common ancestry, but because the effort to formally test this hypothesis can only sharpen our understanding of the nature of the supporting evidence. Furthermore, we hope that this work will lead to a statistical and philosophical analysis of the similarities and differences between the inference of common ancestry and other historical claims, ranging from those that are conceptually very similar to common ancestry, such as common ancestry of languages, to those that are quite different, such as the Big Bang and continental drift. By looking across different historical sciences and their sources of evidence that they use in support of accepted claims, we may hope that a general theory of statistical history may emerge. Thus, we hope that this article will not just stimulate further philosophical and statistical research on evidence for common ancestry, but also on broader questions in historical inference. So yeah, this paper wasn't even done because there was any scientific doubt about common ancestry of all primates. It's just that it's fun to think about. And yeah, it's low-key, but this paper was absolutely written to show up creationist hacks like Sanford. So, um, sure seems like we can use the same types of evidence we use to identify bodies in cold cases, catch killers, and find our long-lost cousins in the modern day to also say, with even more certainty than I've ever seen in any scientific paper before, that humans are related to lemurs. And so, here's, we're going back to Darwin's, I think, and he has a little cartoon. It was just a cartoon. Still not a cartoon. But the thing to know is that now the cartoons are much more sophisticated. Again, they're not cartoons, asshole. But yeah, they're based on data now. But all those colored lines and dots are still just in the imagination of the, in, of the researcher. Funny, because everything we've been shown so far actually said quite the opposite. And guess what? They still should say, I think. Effectively, they do, because they're all hypotheses formed as a result of the collected data. Science isn't in the habit that Sanford is of coming to an absolute conclusion. It's one of the reasons I think Sanford can no longer be called a scientist. He has dogmatic conclusions about science reached for reasons other than the evidence that he will use as an excuse to disguise and mutilate any data that don't conform to his conclusion until they do. And that would really change the way people look at that literature, a body of literature that is truly massive. No, it wouldn't, because all the people who actually know what they're talking about and who talk about it honestly know that these are hypotheses derived as the conclusion of a study. Darwin was wrong about the nature of life. Place your bets now. Will Sanford be honest about his sources and use sources that support rather than refute his claims? This is huge. This is so big. It's the best argument. Like, you wouldn't believe. No one has arguments like this. And people, they tell me, they say, these arguments are immense. So trust me, we have the arguments, no matter what the media says. So we have a picture of Darwin, and he's imagining a cell, 
as you might have seen a cell in his time frame when microscopes were very poor. So it's a little bit of out of focus and it just looks like a, a little uh, blob of jelly, doesn't it? Which isn't how we know cells to be and which is why we don't listen to what Darwin had to say about cellular biology. Weird how science still, this far in, doesn't care at all about Darwin and what he said on the grounds that he said it, and is perfectly happy to ignore Darwin when we know he was wrong. And so this was actually his understanding of life. Life was very simple. Basically, a, each cell was not much more than a blob of jelly. And so here's a quote from him that shows us how simple he thought life was. So he's talking, he's imagining uh, what it would be like, how life originally arose spontaneously. So let's see how he, how he envisions that. But if, and oh, what a big if, we could conceive. Now you understand he's entering into the realm of imagination. Yeah, as Samper himself said, thinking about the problem that you want to use science to solve is basically the first step. It's nice that imagination is bad when Darwin does it, but when scientists who aren't currently obviously threatening Sanford's obviously nonsense beliefs are doing it, that's okay. And who's ready for a dumb and irrelevant discussion of abiogenesis and what Darwin thought about it? But let's see how, just how interesting his imagination is. Um, in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, well, guess what? There are little warm little ponds all over the world, and they all have ammonia and phosphoric salts. That's not a remarkable possibility. Exactly. That's why Darwin said it. He was trying to explain why he thought that the first formation of a living organism via natural mechanisms wasn't as impossible as people might think. So, of course, he points out some relatively common conditions that could be imagined as existing on a prebiotic Earth. Uh, but he adds, with light, heat, electricity, etc., Oh no, you mean Darwin might have known that life needed energy? What a dummy. Well, etc. Light, heat, and electricity, they're everywhere. It's kind of vague, isn't it? Of course it is. It's 1871. No one had anything but the vaguest idea of how biochemistry worked, never mind had a coherent model for abiogenesis. This is just the very basics of the idea. Next he'll be complaining that Newton didn't manage to figure out the Schrodinger equation, and then using that to invalidate all of quantum mechanics. So we have a pond and some chemicals and maybe some electricity. And uh, now he imagines that a protein, now you have to understand he didn't know what a protein was or apparently even how to spell it. Oh, so someone in the days before spell check misspelled a word in a handwritten letter. Let's see if we can get Sanford to handwrite several pages worth of text about a technical subject with no spelling mistakes. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that he'll fail that test, as would I. But Darwin had a notion of what a protein was, but no, he didn't know all the chemistry behind what proteins were. But is that the case now? No, of course not, because unless Sanford knew that he knew better than Darwin, he wouldn't mention this. But that on its own betrays the pointlessness of this whole exercise, because modern abiogenetic research isn't based on some letter Darwin wrote in the 1870s. But he's mad, he knows that proteins are kind of these gooey, ooey things, and so he's mad. A protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. So what does that mean? It's like, it's really laughable um, because he's, you know, let me just try to... Ha ha, dead man thought wrong thing, ha ha ha. Let's just remind ourselves of the scientific quality of the text that Sanford is using as his absolute literal truth to which all facts must go here. This is Genesis chapter 30, verses 25 through 43. After Rachel gave birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me on my way so I can go back to my own homeland. Give me my wives and children for whom I have served you, and I will be on my way. You know how much work I've done for you. But Laban said to him, If I have found favor in your eyes, please stay. I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. He added, Name your wages and I will pay them. Jacob said to him, you know I have worked for you, and how your livestock has fared under my care. The little you had before I came has increased greatly, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I have been. But now, when may I do something for my own household? What shall I give you? he asked. Don't give me anything, Jacob replied. But if you will do this one thing for me, I will go on tending your flocks and watching over them. Let me go through all your flocks today, and remove from them every speckled or spotted sheep, every dark-colored lamb, and every spotted or speckled goat. They will be my wages. And my honesty will testify for me in the future. Whenever you check on the wages you have paid me, any goat in my possession that is not speckled or spotted, or any lamb that is not dark-colored, 
will be considered stolen. Agreed, said Laban. Let it be as you have said, that Sandy he removed all the male goats that were streaked or spotted, and all the speckled or spotted female goats, all that had white on them, and all the dark-colored lambs, and he placed them in the care of his sons. Then he put a three-day journey between himself and Jacob, while Jacob continued to tend the rest of Laban's flocks. Jacob, however, took fresh-cut branches from poplar, almond, and plane trees, and made white stripes on them by peeling the bark and exposing the white inner wood of the branches. Then he placed the peeled branches in all the watering troughs, so that they would be directly in front of the flocks when they came to drink. When the flocks were in heat and came to drink, they made it in front of the branches, and they bore young that were streaked or speckled or spotted. Jacob set apart the young of the flocks by themselves, but made the rest face the streaked and dark-colored animals that belonged to Laban. Thus he made separate flocks for himself and did not put them with Laban's animals. Whenever the stronger females were in heat, Jacob would place the branches in the troughs in front of the animals so that they would mate near the branches. But if the animals were weak, he would not place them there. So the weak animals went to Laban and the strong ones to Jacob. In this way, the man grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. Gee, that all seems like it's ignoring most of what we know about genetics in the modern day. I guess all ideas derived from the Bible are nonsense, using Sanford's own logic. Emphasize what most of you have already gathered. Life is a universe of complexity. A single cell is a universe of complexity that we can't even grasp with our minds. It sure is, like after three billion years of evolution. But was it three billion years ago? I don't know, but I don't have any good reason to think it was. And so he's talking about a protein compound? Let me just explain to you, if the world was made of solid protein. I can immediately tell this is about to be unimaginably dumb. And the oceans were chock full of proteins of every imaginable kind. We would be no closer to having spontaneous life on Earth than if there were no proteins. Um, what are we even talking about? I expected this to be at least, you know, an idea. Proteins are not the basis of life. Life requires an unbelievably complex arrangement of very specific organic molecules and programmed information. Got a citation for that there, Dr. Sanford? Because I don't think you do. I think that's just a bald assertion with nothing to back it up. Especially the word programmed, which is just begging the question about a designer, presumably a divine one, being involved. And can I point out that just like with the last point about the trouble with figuring out consensus phylogeny at the root of the tree of life, that even if abiogenesis were completely impossible and it required divine action to get the first life, it still leaves humans being genetically related to jellyfish, never mind just other primates. To any creationist who might be listening, especially Sanford or Sal Cordova, arguing about things like this sounds to everyone else like you're claiming that the sun is not actually a ball of plasma fusing hydrogen, but it's just a big galactic diode getting its energy from current flow originating from the center of the galaxy and then backing up by pointing out that there is a divergence in the age of the universe estimates based on various sources. Like, even if that's true, it doesn't get you one iota closer to your actual central thesis. It's a useless arguing about the fringe of a different topic. If your conclusion reaches humans aren't apes, and you want to putz about with Darwin's ideas on abiogenesis or protein families, you might as well be off in your room sucking your own thumb for all the good it's going to do young earth creationism. A single cell is like a city, and it is, its information system is comparable to the internet, and its energy system is like a city's energy grid, and its mechanical design allows it to duplicate the whole system. Fun fact, no matter how many analogies we get, it doesn't make complexity imply design on its own. A little protein is not the solution. Good thing that no origin of life researchers think that the answers to the puzzles of abiogenesis is a protein then, isn't it? Darwin's challenge said, if I could demonstrate that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would break down completely. But I can find no such case. Well, why couldn't he find such a case? There were no such cases known then, and there are no such cases known now. That's why. But I did notice that we've gone from abiogenesis to the origin of organs, with no mention of the fact that these are very different things. Slick Sanford. Very dishonest and very slick. Well, let's see. Darwin lived before the biological revolution. He knew nothing about biology. Liar! Liar! So if he looked at a high school biology textbook today, he wouldn't make, couldn't make any sense of it. 
That's not true at all. Much of it was already known by him, like the function of most organs, the basic shape of taxonomy, etc. Sanford is just being needlessly disrespectful to a man who, and I'll keep saying it, doesn't really matter to science at this point. If he opened up a journal today, he couldn't understand the first sentence. I'm not complete, I'm not, you know, be fair to him. Yes, he, he lived before the biological revolution. Which is why his views are of historical, not scientific, interest. But remind me, what do the current crop of biologists who do live after the biological revolution think of Sanford's ideas? Oh right, they write tongue-in-cheek papers pointing out how batshit they are when they bother to even acknowledge that such lunacy still exists. Basically, they treat Sanford the way that doctors treat people, suggesting that the right way to treat the next pandemic is bloodletting or burning doves on an altar. But we, how can we glorify a man who had such little knowledge of the biologi biological science? Just don't. Feel free to ignore him and only pay attention to current biology. It'll leave you with the same result. Common ancestry is a fact. The Earth is 4.5 billion years old or so, and humans are absolutely apes. He didn't know about cell biology, biochemistry, molecular biology, Mendelian genetics, mutations, DNA, genetic code, genomics, population information, population genetics, neurobiology, and about 100 other fields of science. Sure didn't. And neither did the author of Genesis 30, which is why neither of them really matter in modern science. But the difference is one of them was right about something pretty significant in biology, that is natural selection and sexual selection, and of course, common ancestry. And the other was basically wrong about all of biology, except that animals mate to reproduce. So one is celebrated in science for getting something right, but not worshipped as infallible, and the other is ignored in science because they made literally no contribution to science. Again, to be kind to him, everyone in that era didn't know these things, but we have to understand for him that life was something that could be easily explained away as a little bit of clay that is malleable and could be shaped by circumstance. Why? And I really mean this. Why do we need to understand that? What does it matter? I have no clue why creationists think that pointing out that Darwin was wrong and lived in the past is anything but a waste of time. Everyone knows that. No one really cares. Is it just as simple as I often assume? That creationists just think that since they are in a religion with prophets, whose word is said to be the unquestionable word of God, and so they think that the way they treat Moses or Jesus or Muhammad is the same way that scientists treat Darwin? Is it really that simple and inane? If you watching this at home, sitting there, probably on your phone, on the toilet, have any ideas, let me know in the comments, especially you, Susan. Yeah, I see you there thinking I'm just trying to use your name randomly as a joke. I'm not. You should comment to tell me what you think about this confusing and nonsense trend among anti-evolutionists. So here's a really telling story about Darwin. He wrote to a friend uh, this line in some correspondence. The sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, makes me sick. I can sense a lie coming, as if millions of voices suddenly cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. What's he talking about? He's talking about the fact that peacock tail fans are beautiful but maladaptive, and he couldn't seem to reconcile the hindrance the tail put on a peacock's survival with the idea of natural selection. But what does Sanford think he's talking about? He means that he became violently ill. He, had, he was um, a tormented man. Here Sanford spends entirely too long explaining that Darwin had a weak stomach and vomited a lot. I can't see how that detail matters nor do I care to contest it, so we'll move on with the rest of the point, although Sanford blames this on Darwin being spiritually messed up. No, he doesn't give a citation. He literally became sick when he looked at a beautiful feather because he couldn't explain it away. The complexity of something as simple as a feather upset his whole worldview. And there's the lie. So this letter isn't overly long. Let's just read it. <clears throat> My dear Gray, Although I have nothing in particular to say to you, I must thank you for your pleasant letter of March 19th. But let me say, I know what a busy man you are, and pray do not waste more of your time over me. My book, your review, and letters, etc., etc., must have consumed an awful amount. In one sense, the time spent on review has not been wasted, for I feel sure, and I have again, third time, read it all consecutively, that it will produce great effect in leading people to think, and that is all I wish. Hooker indeed tells me he knows cases where your article has had this effect and has greatly mollified opposition to my book. I agree largely with what you say about 
Veracosa theory hypothesis. Indeed, on reading your whole review in one read, I saw that some of my remarks were rather superfluous. It is curious that I remember well time when the thought of the eye made me cold all over. But I have got over this stage of the complaint, and now small trifling particulars of structure often make me very uncomfortable. The sight of a feather in a peacock's tail whenever I gaze at it makes me sick. Under this point of view, your story of the black pigs in the Everglades delights me, and supports other cases, which, though founded on very good evidence, I could hardly digest. Pray keep Professor Wyman up to the mark about writing to me. I should also look at it with great honor and favor if you possibly can find out the name positively of the Red Nuts. I shall be very curious to see Agassiz's remarks. I met a few days ago Professor Cook of your Cambridge, and he brought me direct from Agassiz all sorts of very civil speeches. What can this mean? I do hope to God A is a sincere man. I had always fancied that he was so. You may like to hear about reviews on my book. Sedgwick, as I and Lyell feel certain from internal evidence, has reviewed me savagely and unfairly in Spectator. The notice includes much abuse and is hardly fair in several respects. He would actually lead anyone who was ignorant of geology to suppose that I had invented the great gaps between successive geological formations, instead of it being an almost universally admitted dogma. But my dear old friend Sedgwick, with his noble heart, is old and is rabid with indignation. It is hard to please everyone. You may remember that in my last letter I asked you to leave out about the wheel denudation. I told Jukes this, who was head man of the Irish Geological Survey, and he blamed me much, for he believed every word of it, and thought it not at all exaggerated. In fact, geologists have no means of gauging the infinitude of past times. There has been one prodigy of a review, namely an opposed one by Pictet, the paleontologist in the Bibliothèque Universelle of Geneva, which is perfectly fair and just, and I agree to every word he says. Our only difference being that he attaches less weight to the argument in favor and more to the argument opposed than I do. Of all the opposed reviews, I think this one the only quite fair one, and I never expected to see one. Please observe that I do not class your review by any means as opposed, though you think so yourself. It has done me much good service ever to appear in that rank in my eyes. But I fear I shall weary you with so much about my book. I should rather think there was a good chance of my becoming the most egotistical man in all Europe. What a proud preeminence. Well, you have helped to make me so, and therefore you must forgive me if you can. My dear Gray, yours ever most gratefully, C. Darwin. You might notice that nothing stated there actually says that the reason is the feathers couldn't be explained. So what's the actual reason for this? Well, we can have it from Darwin himself in other places. Primarily, we can read about it in his less famous book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. Chapter 8 is Principles of Sexual Selection, and in this chapter we come across this. We are, however, concerned only with sexual selection. This depends on the advantage which certain individuals have over others of the same sex and species solely in respect to reproduction, when, as in the cases mentioned above, those two sexes differ in structure in relation to different habits of life, they have no doubt been modified through natural selection, and by inheritance limited to one and the same sex. So again, the primary sexual organs, and those for nourishing or protecting the young, come under the same influence, for those individuals which generated or nourished their offspring best will leave, ceteris paribus, the greatest number to inherit their superiority whilst those which generated or nourished their offspring badly would leave but few to inherit their weaker powers. As the male has to find the female, he requires organs of sense and locomotion, but if these organs are necessary for other purposes of life, as is generally the case, they will have been developed through natural selection. When the male has found the female, he sometimes absolutely requires prehensile organs to hold her. Thus Dr. Wallace informs me that the males of certain moths cannot unite with females if their tarsi or feet are broken. The males of many oceanic crustaceans, when adult, have their legs and antennae modified in an extraordinary manner for the prehension of the female. Hence we may suspect that it is because these animals are washed about by the waves of the open sea that they require these organs in order to propagate their kind, and if so, their development has been the result of ordinary or natural selection. Some animals, extremely low on the scale, have been modified for the same purpose. Thus the males of certain parasitic worms, when fully grown, have the lower surface of the terminal part of their bodies roughened like a rasp, and with this they coil around permanently and hold the females. M. Perrier advances this clause, Revue Scientifique, February 1st, 1873, page 865, as one fatal to the belief in sexual selection, inasmuch as he supposes that I attribute all differences between the sexes to sexual selection. This distinguished naturalist, therefore, like so many other Frenchmen, has not taken the trouble to understand even the first principles of sexual selection. An English naturalist insists that the claspers of certain male animals 
could not have been developed through the choice of the female. Had I not met with this remark, I should not have thought it possible for anyone to have read this chapter and to have imagined that I maintain that the choice of the female has anything to do with the development of prehensile organs in the male. Throughout this book, the peacock is mentioned as a previous source of confusion that is now clearly an example of sexual selection. This edition of the book is the second and was published 1874. The original edition is from 1871, so 11 years after the letter to Asa Gray, Darwin had figured out what was puzzling him about the peacock. But it wasn't that feathers are too complex. Darwin never thought that, and if you want to claim he did, then find where he expresses it, because I've tried, and despite the entire corpus of his published work, and even private letters, being searchable online, I couldn't find it. So it's time for creationists to put up or shut up on this one. So, that's really sad, isn't it? I'm not sure what about Darwin figuring out the puzzle of the peacock's fantail is sad. He managed to do it with far less information and technology than we have now, and he was right. And sexual selection remains the consensus view of how such things occur. And not just among real scientists, but even among most creationists, who would say that the peafowl, the turkey, and the chicken all have a common ancestor. So such outrageous ornamentation was unlikely to be shared in the common ancestor of them. Therefore, it was a result of sexual selection in the peafowl lineage. You know, um, for us, we look at a peacock feather or any other beautiful creative thing, and we automatically know what it means. It was designed, it has an author. Not if you want to hold on to the whole created kinds thing. And yet, he still didn't say anything about sexual selection. Weird, isn't it? How tragic that for him, it, was, it just revolted him. It didn't in 1871, so that's a happy ending. Make sure you tip extra for that one, John. But that's it for that whole topic. No actual real point, just pretending Darwin never figured out peacocks. Darwin was wrong about natural selection. Well, how could that be? That's what he's famous for. I'm sure Sanford will tell us how that could be by blatant lies about sources that I can easily check on, or in some cases, already know off the top of my head, like with the Descent of Man. Well, we're going to see how that can be. Bring it on. That's a go. So Darwin's magical selection was a little bit like for him. He didn't, knew, didn't know what was being selected. He didn't know about genes or mutations. He didn't need to, because selection takes place upstream of genes at the level of traits, and traits are observable without reference to the actual genes. That's how Mendel was able to detect the underlying rules of inheritance that are the results of genes by carefully measuring and tracking traits. But also, since natural selection is still a major part of evolutionary biology, maybe instead of hearing about how someone in the middle of the 19th century didn't take genes into account, we should hear about how people today still don't know about them. And that's why they believe in evolution. Except, oh wait, evolutionary biologists very obviously do know about genes, and they measure genetic evolution directly, and can see the effects of selection on traits directly in the genomes of organisms. Ouch. That's gonna suck. I can kind of see why Sanford would rather talk about Darwin, a topic that doesn't really matter, instead of having to contend with the fact that basically all of science says he's wrong about basically everything, basically all of the time. And, and he didn't know about population genetics. Fortunately, we know about it today. So he had a very vague notion, a notion of what was happening. But for him, it was almost a magical wand. Remind me, what's magical about the idea that traits can affect reproductive success? The idea that traits are heritable, and the idea that traits vary in any reproducing population. I can't see anything magical, but those ideas are the whole basis for natural selection. Sounds a lot less like a magical wand, and more of a mathematical and logical inevitability. The type of wand that could turn a frog into a prince. Okay, I know this isn't a Tuesday night stream, but that joke was bad enough for me to go drink. So let me go down a few gallons of rum and come back. And so let's just examine this, uh, this thing. Natural selection is kind of a misnomer. You, you, you have to understand select. To select is a verb. It, it implies an intelligent selector. To select something requires intelligence. Oh, God, ma! Look! Little Johnny here done figured out that sometimes humans personify non-personal things to make it easier to talk about. Huh? Was that? Nah, I don't think he's realized it don't mean that they can't figure out it's just a metaphor. He seems to think it means they worship nature or some such. Yeah, I guess he's pretty stupid after all. Of course, in nature, there is no intelligent selector. Mother Nature isn't a person. She's an allegory and or a metaphor. Little Johnny figured it out. And so 
what's really happening in nature is there is differential reproduction. What do I mean by that? I mean, some things reproduce more than others. Which isn't very remarkable. Let's give him a gold star. You know, he's right. It's not. And yet it's basically all you need for natural selection to operate. You toss in mutation, and you're off to the races with evolution. But if you have something really defective, it's not going to reproduce well. And if you have really something super, it will produce more than normal. And that explains some things, but not very much. Which is why Darwin had to think pretty hard about the peacock. And so we're going to look at that. Let's just consider this process of adaptation, what some people would call microevolution. No, adaptation is also part of microevolution. Microevolution is just evolution below the level of species, and macroevolution is just evolution above that level. So if any part of adaptation leads to a speciation event, then guess what? It's macroevolution. Adaptation is a way to keep a species from changing. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. When organisms enter a new environment, they adapt to it. We've seen this in real time in the Lenski experiment. Fitness increased over the course of that experiment via verifiable mutations that cause observable changes in traits. Let's consider the finch. Okay, Darwin's finches are a beautiful example of how one organism can be fine-tuned to change just a little bit so that it remains well-adjusted to its environment and can continue to be a finch. Of course they're still tanagers, because remember, they're not finches in the family Fringillidae, they're tanagers in the family Thropidae. But that's just monophyly, a requirement for evolution, but they certainly didn't stay the same. They're in five different genera with 19 different species between them. That's not adaptation keeping them the same. If that's what adaptation did, then there'd be one monospecific genus, and that's it. You see that? The, the adaptation keeps the finch being a finch rather than dying off. No, monophyly, that is that you can't escape your ancestry, keeps them tanagers. Adaptation keeps them from going extinct. Two separate things. So that's great. Adaptation is wonderful, and it's good design. If you're going to say that that's design, you're going to have to actually back that up with some kind of citation. But it's really important to understand that this doesn't require any new information. You don't need a new gene to change beak size. A single point, a single letter mutation in the genome is enough to uh, change something like that. Oh, and that's not new information. Why? Do we have a measurement for how much information a mutation creates or deletes, or how much total information is in a genome? No, we don't. Then I don't care what anyone has to say about information. Until you can quantify it, this is just a weasel word that means nothing, but it sounds like something people intuitively understand. It's just word games. It's dishonest, it's stupid, and again, it's frankly disgusting. If there were any truth to Sanford's ideas about evolution, he wouldn't need to resort to lying about sources and literal nonsense about information. That is, things about information that don't actually count as coherent thoughts. Remember, if you don't have any idea what something is, you can't really think about it. And creationists can never define information, which means they can't really think about it, which means they don't actually have coherent ideas about it, which means it's all nonsense in the strict sense of that word. But the basic genome of the bird is the same, the basic uh, design of the bird is the same. It's just a tweaking. It's like getting your, you know, having your car tuned up. Okay, so the basic genome of all apes is the same. I guess humans really are apes. Oh, wait. You mean this argument, in addition to being incoherent, fails to actually establish the points young Earth creationism needs it to? Well, darn. Looks like it's both dishonest and useless even if you ignore the dishonesty. Oh well. So that happens, and so what do we say to adaptation? We give it a great big yes. It happens all the time. It's awesome. It, is, uh, it explains how organisms become fine-tuned to their environment. Resulting in speciation in many cases which is what macroevolution actually is, and is all that's really required to get common ancestry. And you know who shares common ancestry? My subscribers. So if you want to join this family, just subscribe with the button below this video. And if you really want to, turn on all notifications with the bell icon. It would really help out the channel, as the more subscribers I have, 
the more views I get, the more I get discovered. And because I need things like food and shelter, the more this channel can support itself. So let's see what Darwin does with this. Here's a quote from Darwin. Slow though the process of selection may be, if feeble man can do much by his powers of artificial selection, I can see no limit to the amount of change. I can see no limit to the amount of change which may be affected in the long course of time by nature's power of selection. Cool, and since Sanford imagines there's a limit, I'm sure he'll give us what causes that limit and where the limit is and what happens if a population were to reach that limit. Okay, audience, I can hear you thinking that there's no way he'll do that. I have to say, just because he's lied about basically everything so far, doesn't mean now isn't the time he'll pull through a win. You have to believe, like Sanford believed that Noah was both immune to plasma burns and radiation sickness. So there's a name for this. It's a, it's a scientific mistake. It's called extrapolation. And it's not just, extrap scientists know extrapolation is dangerous. They ver they're very careful not to do it very much. And if they do it, they do it little. Yeah, in cases where there is obviously evidence that simple extrapolation will not work because there are mechanisms that prevent the process from carrying on at the observed rate indefinitely, like population growth, the changes in brightness of the sun, the change in the strength of the Earth's magnetosphere, the accumulation of dissolved salts in the ocean. Oh wait, sorry. Those are all things young Earth creationists stupidly extrapolate infinitely into the past in a pathetic attempt to show that the Earth is really 750,000 times younger than we all know it to be. Oops. Well, let's give some examples of when it is appropriate, since there is no barrier or mechanism to change the process. Things like mutation accumulation over phylogenetic time, the expansion of the universe, and radioactive decay. Oh, my bad again. Those are all things creationists like to say can't be extrapolated without ever giving reasons besides that it makes them wrong. It's almost like creationism likes to do the exact opposite of what is scientifically plausible, because get this, young earth creationism is obviously wrong, and most of them know it. This is what's called unbounded extrapolation. Scientists know that's always, always bad science. Is it? Because there's good reason to think that there is no limiting mechanism or good evidence to think that there can be, and the process is going on at a predictable rate, then it actually makes a lot of sense. Now, feel free to come up with a mechanism that prevents the extrapolation beyond a point, but until you do so, scientists will keep on accepting the Big Bang, radiometric dating, and evolution. He's saying, well, if you have, no, you know, let me give you an example. Um, my daughter, uh, when she was a, a young teen, was growing an inch a year. And so I could, my, I, it's risky, but I could say, well, next year, I'll bet she's going to be an inch taller. That's, that's a modest level. That's careful, cautious extrapolation. Which is warranted in terms of not being extended beyond certain limits, because we know that human bone growth plates close, and we have careful measurements of human height from around the world for centuries, and we can simply observe that human growth slows and comes to a halt at a certain point. So now I'm sure we're just about to get to analogous measurements and limiting factors in terms of mutation and selection. Now let's, let's use uh, this type of extrapolation. In a million years, she's going to be a million inches taller. Yep, we know. That's dumb for all the reasons already explained. Do you see that? Is, it leads you immediately into absurdity, doesn't it? So he used a lot of extrapolation. Specifically, he said, since microevolution happens... Actually, both Sanford and he use examples of macroevolution. Because it's nice that by not defining those terms, Sanford can just pretend that Darwin and he don't both agree on this. I think that's an intentional attempt to deceive the persons in his audience. Let's check what the definition of a lie is again. Oh, hmm. Merriam-Webster says that as an intransitive verb, it means 1. To make an untrue statement with intent to deceive, or 2. To create a false or misleading impression, and as a noun, 1a, an assertion of something known or believed by the speaker or writer to be untrue with intent to deceive, 1b, an untrue or inaccurate statement that may or may not be believed true by the speaker or writer, and 2. Something that misleads or deceives. So, um... Pretty conclusive that Johnny Boy here is lying by multiple definitions. There's no limit to what it can accomplish. So let's consider that. No limit to change. So did you know that Darwin believed that a whale, that a, a bear could evolve into a whale? No, I don't know that because that's impossible to know because he never said that. He said that he saw no reason a bear could not turn into something as monstrous as a whale. That's not the same thing as a bear turning into an actual whale. And I can't imagine Sanford doesn't know the difference. Let's just, uh, let's just read a quote from Charles Darwin uh, from his first edition of The Origin of Species. Yeah, 
why bother with that pesky 6th edition when many of the points Sanford has made were already invalidated? We wouldn't want to be honest in our critique of a historical figure who plays essentially no part in evolutionary biology now, would we? I can see no difficulty in a race of bears being rendered by natural selection more aquatic in their structure and habits with larger and larger mouths till the creature was produced as monstrous as a whale. Right, which in no way is Darwin saying bears could become whales, but that they could evolve to become whale-like in habitat and size. See, I see no difficulty in that. Why does he say that? Because he didn't know anything about genetics. Oh cool, so we're going to hear about genetic barriers to bears getting bigger. Because he knew almost nothing about biology. So in his imagination, he could see that. But you see, that's not evidence, and that's not science. That's just a good story. Okay, so I'm sure we'll hear about the problem with the story any minute now. To change a bear into a whale requires a lot of new genetic information. In fact, you have to rewrite the genome. Well. We don't know what genetic information is or how to measure it, so that's a nonsense statement, but also not really giving us why bears couldn't become big and aquatic, which is weird because basically an elephant seal is a big aquatic bear. I mean, not quite, but it's pretty darn close. Seals and bears are quite closely related, and you can even see it in their extremely similar skulls, but also, you know, their genetics. But also, what rewriting has to be done? Whales are artiodactyls, and their genomes aren't radically different from their closest relatives, the hippopotamus. So if bears needed a rewrite to become big swimmy boys, even though that isn't what happened with pinnipeds, why didn't whales need it? And guess what? That is, for many, you know, I'm a geneticist and I'm t I don't want to go through all the details, but I just want you to understand that's not even remotely conceivable. Oh, hell. The source is literally, I'm smart, trust me, bro. Well, guess what? I don't trust Sanford because he has done almost nothing but lie to my face this entire time. Why in the world would I trust him? I wouldn't trust him to go pick up carrots at the store, never mind give me a reasonable explanation of the alleged genetic problems with whale evolution. Okay, so Darwin was wrong about natural selection. Yes, selection happens, but it's very limited actually what it can do. It generally just achieves fine-tuning to keep an organism going the way it was. Source? He made it up. It, uh, it helps to preserve but cannot create life forms. That is, it can slow down. By getting rid of the worst mutations in a population, it can prevent the extinction of species for a time. Ooh, my diny sense is tingling. I can feel the genetic entropy coming up. But it cannot create life, new life forms. And most importantly, uh, my own research from the last 12 years show that selection cannot stop genetic degeneration. And there it is. That means evolution's going the wrong way. And I'd just like to talk a little bit more about that. Why can't selection stop degeneration? Because that's not a real thing. So same reason steel can't stop Superman, yet no one worries about that. Let me just use the hu human population as an example. Human mutation rate is about 100 to 200 new mutations per person per generation. That means you have about 100 more mutations than your parents, and your children will have about 100 more mutations than you have. But not 200 more than their grandparents. You see, mutations don't accumulate in populations at the same rate at which they occur. For this to be the case, every mutation that ever occurred in anyone would have to end up in everyone's genome. We know that doesn't happen for both theoretical and empirical reasons. Let's go over some of the theoretical reasons. Well, obviously, if a mutation occurs in a somatic cell and not a germline cell, it won't be passed on, but it will sure show up when you do a DNA swab from mom and daughter, since, you know, DNA tests aren't usually done by sampling people's gonads. Natural selection will weed out some of the new mutations, since, you know, that's what it does. Genetic drift also tells us that the rarer a genetic variation is, the less likely it is to be passed on than a more common one simply because that's how the math works. This means that new mutations start out likely to go away even if they're not specifically selected against. So does this actually mean that in real life the rate at which genomes diverge is measurably lower than the mutation rate? Well, yes it does. In historical times, the island of Tristan de Cunha was settled by a small number of people from Great Britain. There has been enough time for measurable divergence in the Y chromosomes on the island. And guess what? The rate of divergence is lower than the measured mutation rate from one generation to the next. How shocking. And most mutations are deleterious, so you can see that's kind of a problem. No, it's kind of a lie. Sanford's source for this is Moto Kimura, who himself said that Sanford is wrong. Most mutations are neutral, although not in response to Sanford. And you can see that maybe if, if, um, if these people are a little more mutant than these people... 
If we select away these people, these people are still about 100 more mutations more mutant than their parents. Can you see that selection doesn't stop this problem? Yeah, I can see that it doesn't stop mutation or mutation accumulation. Good thing everyone, including Kimura, realizes that this isn't a problem. And so it's a real problem, and it's acknowledged by other population geneticists. Yeah, like Robert Carter, whom I've already covered and who did know better than Sanford is doing here. Weird, though, how no actual scientists take it seriously. And it's made worse by this fact. Almost all mutations are deleterious and they have a tiny effect. Deleterious means has a negative impact on differential reproduction in the current environment. Remember that for later. And we won't again point out that most mutations are actually completely neutral. You know, if you have three billion letters, you can take away one letter. You've lost some information, but not much. Oh, okay. So information is just how many nucleotides a genome has. That's cool. Maize has more information than rice which has more than frogs, which has more than salamanders, which have more than humans, who have more than mice. I mean, I guess that works, but it also means that any mutation that increases the size of a genome counts as adding new information, and that happens all the time. And so the typical mutation has no visible effect. It's deleterious, it's destroyed information, but no visible effect. Even Mother Nature can't see that effect. Then it's not deleterious, because remember how I said earlier that this would come up? Yeah. See, the thing is that in order to make this genetic entropy argument make sense, Sanford has to make up a new definition for fitness that has nothing to do with evolution. He might as well say that all mutation builds up grapple dung in an organism, and then once it has too much grapple dung, that's it. The organism dies. Don't ask him to bother saying why grapple dung matters. And since no one has ever heard of it, there's no reason for anyone to think it matters. And so it can't be selected away. If natural selection can't select it away, then by definition, it didn't have an impact on reproductive output which means it definitionally can't be said to be deleterious. Some human might not personally like the mutation, but science isn't about that. And so this is a profound problem, and it's similar to the problem with beneficials. Beneficials are like typographical errors in a text that make the text better. Do you see that would be unusual? That'd be rare? Unusual, but even according to Sanford's own source, so overwhelmingly easy to select for that they achieve fixations so fast that he had to ignore them to take a look at neutral variation. Almost infinitely rare. Hey, look, another blatant lie. And so beneficials are too rare to measure how rare they are. That's how rare they are. Weird, because numerous papers in the long-term Lensky E. coli experiment have measured beneficial mutation. To reverse this, it would be like telling Sanford Christianity can't be true because everything in the Bible is historically false. We know that's not true. We know there was a Babylonian exile. We know that afterwards a temple was built. We know that there was a king named David. We know that there was a real King Herod and a real Pontius Pilate. Now, you could argue that that corroboration is insufficient to accept as true the totality of the story, including miracles, but it's dishonest to say that everything about the Bible is false. Similarly, Sanford could say that beneficial mutations, as actually measured, are insufficient. At least that way, he'd just be wrong, not lying. So, and like deleterious mutations, they are, if you add a, one letter to a genome of three billion, it's not going to dramatically increase the information in that genome, will it? More evidence that genetic information is, in Sanford's estimation, simply genome length. So you see, uh, the beneficial mutations are not going to be able to accumulate fast enough to counterbalance all the bad mutations that are happening. I'm just over here looking at the long-term rise in fitness in the Lensky experiment. And I'm over here looking at the paleogenomic data that doesn't seem to show some perfect or even objectively better genome in organisms in the past. In fact, recently, a paleo eDNA study was done that found reindeer DNA that's basal to all extant reindeer. Maybe Sanford would like to make predictions about how it should look based on his genetic degradation, and then look at the DNA from that study and see if they match. So the bottom line is genetic degeneration can't be stopped. There's no, unless there's some unknown mechanism we have not yet discovered, genomes should degenerate. They should go down, not up. I agree, it can't be stopped, but in the way that I can't stop Gandalf the Grey. Not because he's so unavoidable and powerful, but because he doesn't exist to be stopped. And that's, uh, that's profound, uh, really, really profound. And um, if someone can figure out how to stop that, let me know, because I'm, I'd really like to know. Since it's literally never observed anywhere and is mathematically impossible, I'd just say, don't worry about it there, Johnny. So we used, in the last uh, seven years, I've worked with a team of scientists, and we've developed the most advanced, uh, what's called numerical simulation, or computer program that simulates this problem of mutation accumulation. Wow, you put together a sophisticated computer model based on your bad and obviously wrong assumptions, 
Let me guess. It supported your conclusion. By the way, it's called Mendel's Accountant, for those of you who care. Even with selection and recombination and all the things, basically modeling how in real life... Uh, well, in real life, genetic entropy doesn't occur, so... Mutation and selection should happen. And just briefly, um, we find with our numerical simulations that more than 90% of bad mutations are not selected away. They just keep accumulating like rust on your car. Wow, that sounds really bad for the poor hypothetical organisms in the simulation you wrote to prove your own ideas. Got any evidence that reflects the real world? No? Hmm. Weird. And we find that the rare beneficials have almost no effect on the scenario, even if we crank up the mutation rate of beneficials. And what we find is that fitness continuously declines in our simulations, and we see that extinction in these runs is inevitable. Oh cool, because in actual experiments with real organisms, that's not what happens. And we know because, you know, rather than just writing a computer program that conveniently spits out the expected answer based on dumb assumptions, Richard Lenski just actually took real organisms and put them in an unusual environment and has been keeping track of their evolution for decades. He's seen fitness increases and no trend towards extinction. The best creationists have done to counter this as far as I can see is point out that many lines of the experimental bacterium have higher than wild type mortality rates. That's true. If you total up the number of bacteria that die per unit time, it's higher. But that's because, um, they reproduce more in that environment, so there are way more of them. So of course, more of them die. That's like pointing out that more humans die per day in AD 2023 than did in AD 420. Well, yeah. In 2023, the population is over 8 billion. In 420, it was less than 200 million. And so Mendo's accountant is a program that we use, and it's freely available. You can download it on the internet. Here's a fun experiment. Download Mendel's accountant and then get it to mimic the outcome of the Lenski experiment as reported in numerous papers, one of which I've linked in the sources. It's sustained fitness gains and variability in fitness trajectories in the long-term evolution experiment with Escheria coli by Lenski et al., published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Biological Sciences on December 22, 2015. Just the title poses a problem for Mendel's accountant, by the way. So um, here's just a quick, two quick illustrations um, for you. The first one shows that uh, the red line shows the number of mutations uh, that are accumulating goes up linearly through time. So we're going through about 250, gen 200, a little over 250 generations are passing during this experiment. Okay, so I'm expected to believe that mutations have fixed fitness effect, which is completely wrong, that neutral mutations simply don't accumulate despite being the majority of mutations, and despite the majority of the genome of all organisms being non-sequence constrained, and that mutations can't be weeded out by natural selection despite being deleterious, which means selected out by natural selection. Why is it that even the supposedly most sophisticated creationist claims are the kind of thing you realize don't work with just paying attention in a freshman biology course? And the bad mutations are accumulating to very high numbers, to up to tens of thousands of mutations per person. Whereas the good mutations, even though we put in one, one out of every 10 mutations is beneficial, which is radically too high, we see that uh, the Good mutations are accumulating, even with natural selection, much more slowly than the bad mutations. Which is at odds with observed reality, meaning that the simulation is worthless. That's how you test a simulation. Does it give realistic results when tested with realistic settings mimicking known events? If it can come up with results broadly similar to real life, then it's a good simulation. If it can't, well then, it's a bad simulation. No matter how sophisticated it is, or how many lines of code it has. And so what we see in the same run, same experiment, is that the fitness goes down precipitously, and the blue line, which is population size, crashes at the end, and the population goes extinct. I just wanted to remind everyone of the title of that 2015 paper by Lenski et al. It was Sustained Fitness Gains and Variability in Fitness Trajectories in the Long-Term Evolution Experiment with Escheria coli. No reason I wanted to say that, just thought it would be fun for everyone to remember what the paper describing a real-world test of this hypothesis was called. Population goes extinct in just 268 generations. And this, these are settings that we feel are very realistic. Wow, fruit flies have a generation time of 12 days at the long end. So if this were accurate, fruit flies would have about 3,216 days before their two entropy to exist. That's less than nine years. So if any of my audience are more than nine, they've watched fruit flies go through so much genetic entropy that they should be extinct. If you're 18, you've seen this happen twice over. Does God have a divine fruit fly factory pumping up perfect fruit flies? If Mendel's accountant is accurate, he must. But hey, let's give him a free order of magnitude. 
I mean, he is a young Earth creationist, and we like to give them a free order of magnitude just to be nice. So now the predicted shelf life of fruit flies is just over 88 years. Now, not much of my audience is that old, but luckily the record of fruit fly experiments in science goes back to 1910, which is over a century ago at the time of this writing. More than enough time for us to be out of fruit flies, assuming the 1910 variety were perfect divine fruit flies that God just created then. See how this really doesn't work if you think about it for any time at all? We can change the settings and, ch and delay the extinction, but we can't, unless we go to totally dishonest settings, we cannot stop it. It means, what does it mean? It means he told a computer to make him feel smart by unrealistically mimicking his expectations. And he patted himself on the back because now the doom of humanity is close at hand, but he thinks Jesus will come to save him before that, so it's okay. It also means he doesn't actually care if he's right because he's never bothered to actually compare his computer results against real world results. Or if he has, he's just lying about the whole thing, which unlike in other parts of the speech, I'm not quite ready to say. It means uh, that uh, genetic systems like everything else is subject to entropy. Entropy is the statistical fact that in isolated systems, the capacity of a system to perform work as defined by displacement of matter goes down or stays the same. It is not some vague idea that disorder goes up. Order does not map onto entropy in the real world. And pretending it does or that evolution somehow violates the second law of thermodynamics is just to show that you don't know what entropy is. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I don't think Sanford could reliably tell anyone what the units are that are used to measure entropy in the first place. And the genetic systems are running down even with natural selection. And so uh, bottom line, uh, there's genetic change over time. If that's your definition of evolution, genetic change over time, I am totally a believer in evolution. Well, evolution is at minimum a change in allele frequency across generations in a reproducing population. So yes, he does believe in evolution. Uh, but the problem is it's the evolution down, not up. Citation needed, Lodwig. And so uh, that's, that's profound, and I think that that's um, something we can very rigorously prove to any reasonable person. Weird then how the scientific consensus is that these ideas are hilariously stupid and not worth the paper they're printed on. Must be a vast conspiracy. So now we're, we're to the end and um, we come back to the issue of Darwin was wrong. And I'm back to the point that Darwin isn't Pope of science. He's not the prophet of evolution. It doesn't matter if he's wrong. It matters what's happening in current science, which has a lot more data to work from than he did. He was wrong about the science, but most importantly, he was wrong about God. So let's consider his life. He won fame like no other person except Christ, perhaps, and Muhammad. So the Buddha doesn't count? Plato? Confucius? Newton? Einstein? Eh, forget about them, I guess. For 150 years, he has, the whole world has bowed down to Darwin. Wait. Have I not been invited to the Darwin worship services? You guys, why didn't you tell me about this? I am not okay with being left out like this. You know, Hitler was famous for a, f a decade. Yeah, and that's where you're fucking done, Sanford. We're not gonna sit here and compare Darwin and the leader of the National Socialist German Workers' Party in any way, even in their level of fame or notoriety. Man, what a piece of shit Sanford is. And I came to this thinking I'd like him reasonably well. You know, like how I rather like Todd Wood. I've also recently heard that Sanford wouldn't be interested in perhaps explaining himself about this. So I also have to assume that he's a coward, in addition to being an obvious liar. I guess we can add Sanford to the list of Meyer and Stelling in terms of blatantly mendacious creationist hacks. Oh well, if you liked this video, hit like and leave a comment telling me what you liked. If you didn't like it, hit dislike and tell me why not in the comments. Either way, I hope you subscribe and use the notification bell to turn on all notifications so you're always notified when I have new content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Van Toven, Tapioca Weasel, Denny5252, Ian Chen, Landon Knoll, Mabity Babity, McSpooks, Sphincter of Doom, The Veteran Will Bead, Eleron Teller, and Pat L. Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month, my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. 
If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if an annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.